We've got about uh, about 50 participants, but I think we, at 105, we'll call it, we'll start. Um, we should let uh, the webinar open and leave it early for them to join, right? They was waiting. Right. Yeah. So Dustin, are there still people wait, waiting in line to get in or are these other people? to be chatted to. Okay, so we can get started. So welcome to the uh, UF Nelms Institute for the Connected World workshop on women in IoT. Thank you everybody for attending and coming to see what these wonderful ladies have to say as well as checking out some of the facts about our center that you'll find out through the course of the afternoon. Um, good afternoon to people here in the US. Good evening to people across the pond and good morning to those staying up late. We really appreciate you staying up late or getting up early to watch us in all parts of the world. So first we're gonna start out with a welcome from our director or co-director of the Nelms Center. Uh, but before we do that, let me just share the program so that everybody knows the plan for today. If you haven't looked at it, the program is here on the regular Women in IoT. Resume share real quick. <clears throat> the Women in IoT workshop webpage that you've been going to to get information. You can click here to see the program for the event. And as registrants, you can also click um, just workshop program to get to the workshop, the uh, link, Zoom links. So these are all in the emails I sent today, but just pointing out where they are. So at this site, we have everything with the links connected and you can see the student poster links and everything else. So as people join in, that's where you should go if you get mixed up about where you should be in the Zoom. And so now without further ado, I will hand it over to Mi Tai who will introduce the uh, day. Thanks, Mi Tai. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So uh, let me share my screen a little bit. So y'all can see my screen, right? Uh, so again, good afternoon and good evening or good morning or good day to all the ladies out there and perhaps some gentlemen, right? Uh, so I would like to extend our warmest welcome to all of you from all over the world uh, to our inaugural annual workshop on women in internet teams organized by the NAMS Institute for the Connected World. And the theme of this year is leading through the change. So I also would like to uh, take this opportunity to quickly highlight the history of our NAMS Institute. So the Institute was created from the generosity and this passion, a very strong passion for internet team and its impact to the world with the five million gift uh, from David NAMS to honor his father and both of them get a degree from UF together with the, the Donation for the endowed chair from Dr. Samoto, who also got his degree from UF, and that's how we have here today. So since the creation, we have grown very quickly, and today we have uh, about 50 faculty members, and we also have actively collaborated with many universities all over the world, and also partnered with several companies in the industry, and some of you was invited today as well. And also, I would like to take a moment to introduce our organizing committee of uh, this workshop this year without them. We don't have this open today, right? Uh, so first of all, the two co-chair is Dr. Janet McNair, professor at uh, ECE UF, and myself uh, from uh, the science department at UF. And we have three more uh, professors, Dr. Damla Tucker, uh, the professor at University of Central Florida, uh, Dr. Tennis New, assistant professor at the University of South Florida, and Dr. Litting Hu, Assistant Professor at Florida International University. So at the, the theme of this year is leading through the change, right? 
we also walking through the very last minute change very dynamically to make this particular program happen. You know, so as the Dr. Janet McNair also mentioned, one afternoon we pack everything, right? We have one invited keynote, two uh, panels with all this very well-known leadership in the world. So I hope you all can stay with us on to very to the end. The Zoom link here, the webinar will be from one to four. After that, we will break down to five Zoom links uh, with the poster presentation together with YouTube channel for some, uh, uh, some uh, tech talk, talk style. Uh, so toward the end, you will get more information about this. And uh, you will hear more from our invited speaker and panelists. Uh, so I would like again to welcome you all to this uh, workshop and hopefully, uh, and, and again, thank you for uh, making the time to stay with us today. And with that, I return the stage back to uh, Janice to introduce our dean. Hi, Janice. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker who will give a welcome. But first I want to remind everyone to stay on mute, as especially as you type or, or do other things while you're watching. We can hear everything that's happening on your computer, so make sure you're on mute. And if you're not one of the speakers, maybe to turn off the video as well, so the focus can be on whoever is speaking at the time. And as I mentioned, I have the pleasure of introducing our Dean for the UF College of Engineering. She is Cami Abernathy. She is, as I mentioned, the Dean of the Herbert Wertham College of Engineering here at uh, well known in material science and okay can you still hear me all right the message came up the zoom ended and my heart dropped for a second <laughs> so cami <laughs> is a professor in material science and engineering her research interests are in thin film electronic materials and devices using medical organic material uh, chemical vapor deposition and molecular beam epitaxy as we all know obviously uh, she's been recognized for many things she's worked in industry she came to uf as a professor um, she's a fellow of the American Physics Society, as well as, several, as well as several other societies. She's the director of the ASCE Engineering Dean's Council Executive Board. She's made great advances at UF in terms of diversity and inclusion, as well as research expenditures. And I know, ha, uh, know from a good report that her son's an excellent baseball player. So what can, <laughs> how can you go wrong there? So let me introduce Cami, and she'll tell you a little bit more about us. Thank you, Janice. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the NELMS Women in IoT workshop today. I want to begin by congratulating Janice and me, Tai, uh, for organizing this event. What a great idea for a webinar. I also want to acknowledge the Warren B. NELMS Institute. As me mentioned earlier, this institute was formed to bring focus to the critically important area of Internet of Things, and as evidenced by events like this, it's succeeding in doing just that. In fact, we're very fortunate to have with us today some representatives of the family who made this institute a reality. David Nelms and his parents, Patsy and Warren Nelms, were the inspiration for this institute. It was, in fact, David's desire to honor his father's passion for tinkering and networking with sensors before IoT was even a field that led to the naming of the institute. Both David and his father are alums of our college and great representatives of Gator Engineering. We're very grateful to David and his family for supporting our IoT efforts. As I mentioned, IoT is a critically important field, but it is one like much of electrical engineering and computer engineering in which women are not well represented. Obviously, that's got to change in the future if we're going to continue to advance technologically and societally. Events like this one are very important to helping us achieve that goal. Role models do make a difference. They do. And we have some outstanding role models speaking today. I want to thank them and our organizers for their excellence and their leadership. Thank you all again for joining us and go Gators. Thank you, Cami. And thanks for that great welcome and occasion. And now Domla will introduce our keynote speaker. And thank you also for getting us back on track. So Domla. 
Thank you so much. It's great to see everyone here. It's my great pleasure to introduce you our keynote speaker, Professor Wendy, Wendy Heiselman. Uh, Wendy is essentially the dean of the Edmund Heim School of Engineering uh, and Applied Sciences at the University of Rochester. Um, she's also the full professor of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering with a secondary joint appointment in computer science. Uh, Wendy wears many, many hats. Uh, apart from, from being a Dean of Engineering, she's also a prolific researcher uh, in the field of uh, wireless uh, networking and communications for several years. Um, her research was supported over $10 million in grants and published over 150 uh, publications, uh, which were cited 50,000 plus times. So she's also one of the most highly cited researchers within the wireless networking communication. But I'm not done yet. Um, and is also a co-founder of the current steering committee member of the N2 Women. That stands for uh, Networking, Networking Women. And I know that we have several of our N2 Women members here uh, joining for us with us today. Uh, Wendy is also the member of Society of uh, Women, Engineer, uh, Women Engineers, the, as we know, SUI. Uh, and finally, she's also the ACM and IEEE Fellow. So we couldn't be more excited to have Wendy here uh, as our keynote speaker. So without further ado, I give you Wendy. Thank you, Damla, for that great introduction. Um, let me just share my screen to get the slides up and then, okay, can you see my slides? All good? Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'll assume everyone can see my slides. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank all of the organizers of this event, first of all, for hosting an event like this. I think it's so important, and I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end of my talk about um, why we really do need to encourage many, many more people, especially those who are traditionally underrepresented in this field, to go into this field, because there's a lot of really hard questions that need to be answered. And so having events like this to encourage the next generation to continue research in this field, I think is so incredibly important. And I also think having institutes like the Nelms Institute that focus on this area is, is what, how we're going to make progress moving forward. So I'm also very appreciative that this institute Institute exists because I think uh, research in this area is going to address a number of critical problems moving forward and I'll talk about that a little bit. But what I really want to do today is give a little bit of a historical perspective on uh, sensor networks and some of the research that has gone on over the last 20 or so years in this field, as well as look ahead to how um, big data and some of the new techniques in data science are going to mesh with some of the work we've done for the last 20 years in wireless sensor networks to solve some new problems moving forward. So hold on one second, let me just move my screen over here. So um, as everyone knows, wireless sensor networks have and will continue to transform everything we do in our lives from supporting personalized healthcare to enhanced environmental monitoring to security and safety. And there have been a number of projects uh, that have developed over the past several years uh, that, that utilize the full strength of wireless sensor networks and what we now call Internet of Things, but for, for years we, we called this as, as wireless sensor networks. So one of the first uh, really interesting projects uh, that utilized large scale sensors, uh, remote sensors gathering data was the ZebraNet project that was developed out of Princeton University uh, back in the late 19, uh, uh, 1990s, early 2000s, uh, where they basically put collars on zebras with embedded sensors and communication capability to um, understand the migratory patterns of zebra in Kenya. Um, and that that uh, uh, ideal of trying to monitor our environment and, and the bio um, habitation of our environment continues today. And so you'll see projects ranging from the monitoring of rivers and lakes to try and understand pollutants um, and, and the flow of pollutants and where they're coming from and how they uh, transmit through the rivers and lakes to uh, monitoring our oceans um, for the health and safety of the aquatic life within the oceans to monitoring just the regular environment. So pollutants in the air and how we can both control and understand the spread of these types of pollutants. Um, and of course, we've all seen and, and many of us have used sensors to enhance our own health from monitoring our everyday physical activity and tracking things like tracking how many steps we take 
um, to, to help us live healthier and more active lives, to sensors that help care for us while we're in the hospital setting, that cut the wire essentially. So rather than being in a hospital and, and hooked up to, to monitors that, that tether you, um, being able to walk around and move around with wireless sensors is a huge benefit to those who are in the hospital setting. Um, and of course, in this day and age, with everything going on with the pandemic, it's more important than ever to enable continuous monitoring out of a hospital environment to uh, enable those who really are, do not need to be in a hospital to continue to get, to get their care at home. And so I think this is going to be another application area that's going to see increasing importance over the next decade. Another area that I think is really interesting uh, use of wireless sensor networks is in precision agriculture. How can we grow food more effectively and more efficiently? And as we've seen um, our, our environmental situation worsen over the last decade, we have more, um, more hurricanes, more floods, droughts are, are a big problem in many parts of the country, as well as the very sad fires that we're seeing throughout California now. There's more and more of a need to understand what the environmental conditions look like and how that impacts agriculture so that we can grow our food better, more cost effectively, more efficiently and more effectively so that we can continue feeding the plant. It. And I think IoT and sensor networks are going to play a key role in this industry moving forward. Disaster relief. I, I, I just mentioned a number of disasters that we face, unfortunately, increasingly uh, more and more these days. And sensor networks, again, uh, are a great way to help first responders as they go into areas that are affected by disasters like fire or earthquakes to try and understand what the damage has been, what areas are safe and what areas are not safe to enter into. And finally, I want to just uh, end with one uh, additional area that I think is a real ha has real potential for wireless sensor networks moving forward, and that's the area of vehicular sensor networks, where vehicles, cars, are able to provide better traffic control and create better driving conditions for everyone on the road. And you've seen this more and more with some of the newer cars, especially some of the um, hybrid and um, and electric vehicles that have that are essentially um, they're essentially uh, uh, computers with wheels. Um, that's how they operate. If you look at a Tesla and things like that. So tons and tons of sensors in the vehicle, as well as sensors that can help us understand what's happening on the road, what's the condition on the road, what other cars are around us and so forth. So all of these applications re rely on better and more accurate and more energy efficient sensors and communication technology to make these applications a reality. So I wanted to provide a bit of history of uh, wireless sensor networks. So as everyone knows, sensors have been around for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and they've actually even been networked together for many, many years. Um, way back in the, in the 1950s and 60s, you'd see sensors on very big machines to try and understand when uh, machine failure was about to happen and so forth. But they were never really networked together, um, at least wirelessly, until uh, it wasn't until about the mid 90s and early 2000s uh, that advances in communication technology, mobile ad hoc networking, embedded computing, low power MEMS, and other different technologies had advanced enough to actually make current day wireless sensor networks possible. So when all of these technologies matured and came together, really their crossroads, their crossroads is what led to um, the development of wireless sensor networks. So um, a little bit of uh, um, background on, a little bit of background on uh, the sensor nodes themselves. Um, and, and this was something that also really led to lots of developments in wireless sensor networks is that people started developing around the late 1990s and early 2000s, they started developing a lot of hardware that enabled researchers all over the world to utilize this hardware and develop their own applications, programmable systems where you could design your own wireless sensor network. And this really started with the um, development of um, uh, work that happened at UCLA and, and Berkeley were some of the, the big areas where this started with the development of these embedded systems for uh, wireless networking and, and signal processing and sensing. And so there was a whole range of different technologies that were created, um, including you can see here the MICA platforms were developed, the, the initial MICA modes, the MICA Z, MICA dots. 
um, as well as the Tmoat Sky and the iMoat. Those were some of the initial platforms that were developed. And one that I really wanted to point out that was very interesting was uh, work done on uh, the spec moat and smart dust. This was work done at UCLA and UC Berkeley. And you can see a picture down here of the, uh, the spec moat on a chip. Uh, where the idea was what could you put in something that was so small it was essentially the size of a dust moat. How much uh, computing could you do? How much sensing could you do? How much communication could you do? And it turned out you could do some, not a lot. Um, they didn't get obviously very high uh, uh, bit rates that you could get out of a, a system like this, but it was a really interesting concept of you just have this computing power that is so small it's like a speck of dust and what could you do with that sort of computing power? And then, of course, work continued until the present day when there's a whole range of different types of moats that you can get available um, to use to, to run your own, to write your own um, uh, wireless sensor network uh, systems. And so you can see here that um, a number of these exist today, and some of them, like the WASP moat and the Arduinos, are really usable moat. Mo uh, platforms that have lots of different modalities. So you can stack different sensors on top of them. You can stack different communication uh, platforms on top of them and basically create your own moat out of whatever it is that you would like to uh, um, to utilize in, in that form. So lots of different opportunities to create um, new sensing devices. Now, sensor networks have um, a number of uh, different limitations on them because of the hardware. So we've had, we've seen all of this advance in wireless sensor network hardware and embedded systems hardware, um, but all of these devices have some limitations. So you can see here a very high level view of what a wireless sensor node looks like. So you have the sensing unit or multiple sensing units, you have the computing core that it, uh, enables you to compute on whatever it is you're sensing, and uh, you have a transceiver that allows you to communicate. And this is all powered by typically a fixed power unit. Um, and so that leads to a number of different resource limitations. And the goal has always been in developing algorithms and protocols for wireless sensor networks to efficiently use these limited resources while maintaining whatever application required quality of service there is. So the interesting thing and the unique thing about wireless sensor networks is they're very different than a traditional network where when I need to send a file, I have to send all that data. And the only way that the application is successful is if I send all that data. In wireless sensor networks, you don't necessarily need to send all of the sensed data. You need to figure out what is the important data and only send that data to save your um, resources as best as possible. And so a lot of research has gone into figuring out what is it that's important and how should you send that data. And the limitations are on bandwidth, energy, computation, memory, all of them are quite limited in wireless sensor networks. And one of the biggest issues that has faced wireless sensor networks is the availability of energy and the use of energy. And you can see here two different types of moats, but most of the moats and even you know, your cell phone and your computer have the same uh, types of power consumption profiles where the communication, the transmit and the receive components of a, an embedded device are the most energy inefficient, the most energy hungry. It takes the most energy to communicate and to receive and to transmit your data compared to anything like the sensing of the data, the computing on the data, and obviously idle and sleep. Um, the goal of those is to reduce your power consumption. So one of the goals of sensor network research over the last 20 years or so has really been um, to figure out how do I create a sensor network that meets the application goals, but knowing that I have this limited energy. Because what happens is if you have, if you go back to um, these moats here, actually here is probably the best slide to see this, you can see that one of the biggest um, components that creates the most space and, and takes the most weight for these, if you look at the TELUS B moat, you can see this very clearly here, is the batteries. The batteries are the biggest bottleneck of these types of moats. And once you run out of the energy in the battery, you have to then figure out how to get back the moat and, and put in new batteries or recharge the batteries. And that becomes really challenging. So a lot of research is focused on how do we design our approaches so that we can minimize the use of energy and make these devices last for as long as possible. 
However, if you think about it, um, energy is abundant in our world. Um, it's everywhere. We've got wind, we've got solar from the sun, we've got vibration energy everywhere. There is lots and lots of energy that is available in our environment. And people have known this and utilized this type of energy for years. We've had, uh, you think back to the olden days of running the, the water wheel to, to run the mill, and now we have hydroelectric and we have uh, wind farms, and there's even uh, approaches to harnessing the power of the waves under the ocean. So we have figured out that uh, reusable energy is, is key to uh, our, our energy uses on this planet and is gonna be even more important moving forward. So why not consider the, those same sources of energy for wireless sensor networks? And people have started to think about, rather than having um, sensor devices and nodes that require you to retrieve them and change the battery, um, utilizing these sorts of uh, renewable energy sources to be able to power the, the, the moats. And so some examples that have been developed um, are utilizing solar energy, uh, mechanical energy, such as from vibration or movement, uh, thermal energy, as well as electromagnetic um, energy from the environment where either you're um, harvesting ambient electromagnetic energy or you are essentially illuminating a moat with uh, an electromagnetic signal that is designed specifically to charge the device. So um, this has all been uh, in, in development now and, and uh, research has looked at how do we utilize these sources of, of energy. And if we have infinite energy, well, we should be done, right? We now um, can continuously power our nodes. However, one of the issues with using renewable sources of energy like these is that they're not available all the time. So if you think about solar, for example, well, when the sun goes in at night, uh, there's no solar energy available. Or if there is a shadow because your next your sensor mode is beside a tree and at some angles the, the tree leaves are uh, covering the solar panel, you're not going to have energy available. Same thing with mechanical, that uh, whatever surface it is you're harvesting the mechanical energy from may not be moving all the time. Um, so all of these sources are great for enabling the recharging of energy, but you can't use them alone. And so um, all of these sorts of self-powered systems have to have some sort of energy storage. And there are three main types of energy storage that can be considered uh, within these types of uh, wireless recharge of um, energy harvesting wireless sensor nodes. So you can use traditional rechargeable batteries, um, but these tend to be inefficient in terms of charging. So a lot of the energy that they get when charging is converted to heat. And so that's not a very good use of um, uh, of the energy that you're harvesting. And they do have limited number of charging cycles, so eventually they will die out. Um, so people have also used traditional capacitors, which are very efficient at charging, but tend to have very limited capacity. So newer technology includes supercapacitors as really good energy storage devices for these types of wireless sensor networks. They have efficient charging and very high capacity, um, and they are small size and, um, and are very efficient for these types of applications. So if we want to think about self-powered wireless sensor networks, so the energy source is there, but as I said, it's often unreliable, erratic, or intermittent. So not only do we need to have an energy storage uh, system like a supercapacitor available, but we need to be able to monitor and, and uh, model the harvesting process so that we can understand what it looks like and when we ex can expect to have energy and when we won't expect to have energy. And then we also need um, to have some sort of intelligent design that allows for adaptive energy management so that you can change what it is you're doing as the system, um, as the energy in your, available in your system changes. And so, for example, if we look at an energy harvesting sensor node, it, we, we would change the model. If you remember a few slides back, I talked about what a sensor model looks like. Now we have to adapt the sensor model a little bit. So in what an energy harvesting sensor node looks like is you have your um, harvesting source, whatever uh, form of renewable energy that you're capturing, and then you convert that to be able to be stored within some sort of energy buffer, like a supercapacitor. And then your sensor node, your radio, your compute power, your sensing, all of that can be charged 
off of the energy that comes out of the energy buffer. And then that's used to power your node. So once you have a model like this, then it's really interesting to think about the fact that each device, so now this, each one of these is a different node, each device is going to have a different energy buffer. And the question is then, how do you make the best use of the available energy in the network when the available energy isn't in one place? It's distributed among all of the different nodes in different amounts. And so one node may have a very high energy buffer, a lot of energy stored in its buffer, whereas another node might be very close to depleting its buffer. What do you do with that? And how do you design your algorithms and protocols to take that into account? And so you need to think about and be able to model things like your medium access control, your channel access, who should get access and how should they get access? For example, in the, in the example I was just talking about where one node has a lot of energy and the other doesn't, the node that doesn't have a lot of energy, you want to be able to capture the channel really quickly. The node that has a lot of energy can do a lot of channel sensing and back off um, before it captures the channel because it has a lot of energy. It has enough time to be able to try things out and back off when another node actually wants to access the channel. So figuring out how you would do your Mac. Same thing with routing. If you know that there's a node that is running low on energy, you clearly don't want that to be a router for um, a, another node getting its data where it needs to go. So you need to think about how do you reframe and how do you redesign your MAC and routing protocols based on the energy arrival and the energy consumption and your known models for energy. And I wanna give you a couple of examples um, uh, where this can be used in real life situations. And one example is I was really uh, lucky to work on a project with some researchers from Sri Lanka to develop a network called JumboNet. The idea behind this project was that um, in Sri Lanka, there's a problem called the human elephant conflict where um, elephants live very close to villages. And so elephants will wander into the villages and destroy uh, farms of the villagers. And also in, in some cases, um, uh, there have been deaths of the villagers from the elephants. And at the same time, the villagers wanna keep the elephants out of their communities. And so there's been death of elephants um, trying to keep the elephants out of their communities. So this is a real problem. And the goal of JumboNet was to figure out how we we could monitor the locations of the elephants to be able to warn villagers when uh, the elephants were coming close and develop techniques before they actually entered into the village. So um, the idea with JumboNet was if we could develop a uh, sensor node, a self-powered sensor node that was capable of um, uh, uh, powering the device and, and the device could track the locations of the elephants, we would have a system that could help mitigate the human elephant conflict. And so the researchers in Sri Lanka developed this node that had a, um, a vibration uh, energy harvester, as you can see in the picture down here, that was able to gather energy as the elephant went about its daily uh, life, walking, eating, sleeping, bathing, et cetera. And you can see here uh, the amount of energy harvested over time um, that when obviously when the elephant was sleeping, very little energy is harvested. But when they're eating, their head uh, bounces up and down. And there's a lot of energy that can be harvested from the motion of the elephant um, and walking as, as well. Uh, obviously, when the elephant is walking, there's a huge amount of um, kinetic energy that can be harvested into the device and used to power the um, uh, power the nodes that are tracking the elephant's location. So this was very successful, but again, we had to do work to figure out, given that there is not energy all the time, um, what do we expect the average energy to be and how can we utilize that average energy to ensure that we get the data that is needed, where it's needed, when it's needed. As another example, um, uh, there have been a number of similar research efforts uh, aimed at exploring how best to create and how best to utilize energy to create these self-powered wireless sensor networks. So here is some work that we did where you can imagine you have two nodes, one that is in full sun, the unshaded cell, and one that is in shade. Um, so it's maybe sitting under a tree or sitting by a house or something. And so one of the nodes has a lot of energy, the other one doesn't. If you're looking at using a, a MIMO system, a multiple input, multiple output antenna system, uh, the transmitter and receiver both have multiple antennas. And the question is how many antennas should you use on the transmitter side and how many on the receiver side? 
Well, it turns out that if you want to um, save energy on, in, in this case, let's say the receiver side is the one that's the shaded cell, you have uh, the minimum number of antennas on, on the receiver side and you use the most antennas on the transmit side. So the transmitter spends a lot of energy getting its data to the receiver, but the receiver has to minimally use energy to get the data. And then as, as the situation reverses, you might change who uses more antennas and how the communication is done. So uh, it's important to think about for these types of networks, how best to utilize the energy that's available in each of the different devices, given that it's distributed throughout the network. So as you can see here, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of interesting work that has gone on over the past many years in looking at these types of systems and how best to operate them, how best to utilize the energy that's available, and now looking at how do we utilize um, energy that could be renewable and coming in at different rates and how do we model that and design protocols and networking solutions to, um, uh, to maximize our benefit to the application. But what I want to do now is look at the data aspects of wireless sensor networks. So with so many different applications and advances in low power and small devices, wireless sensor networks are now able to produce data on a scale never before possible. And I really like this quote. I don't know if you can see it up here. It's kind of small, but it says, we are giving our world a digital nervous system, location data using GPS sensors, eyes and ears using cameras and microphones, along with sensory organs that can measure everything from room temperature to pressure changes. And this is really what IoT is all about, is getting data, tons and tons of data from the environment to try and understand our environment and make sense of it. So our sensors we know are capable of giving us this plethora of information about our environment. So what is data science? How does this come into play here? Well, we need to look to see um, where, what, what this technology can do and what research is needed to get us to where we need to go. So data science is an interdisciplinary field. So it combines computer science, AI, we'll talk a little bit about AI, as well as math and statistics. And um, really important though, is it's, it's not just a tool, a CS tool or a math and statistics tool, but it really requires domain knowledge. There has to be some kind of domain system that comes into play in order to uh, best make use of the data that is provided. And we've seen this in sensor networks for years. We've talked for many, many years about how sensor networks are different than traditional wireless, net wireless networks. It's about the data. It's about getting the right data, answering the right questions for whatever that sensor network is designed to be able to produce answers for. That's essentially what data science is all about, extracting actionable information from data. And one thing I think that's really important is um, the keyword in data science is not data, it's science. So there's been a lot of hype over the last five years or so um, about big data, about how much data you have ac ac access to these days. And that's incredibly important because data really is the new gold. It's gonna be the new key that will differentiate different businesses. So having access to data is huge, but it's, it's not the data per se. It's not the fact that I have terabytes of data at my disposal. It's what is known about the data, data, what's done with that data, how that data is used that becomes really important. And that's what data science is all about. So data science is only useful when data are used to answer a question. And how does that fit into what it is we're looking at here? So just a little bit of note about AI, ML, uh, deep learning, and data science. So these things are all very much interconnected. So if you think about AI, artificial intelligence, as the broad concept of machines being able to carry out smart tasks, that's, that's the huge goal that we have. Um, and, and it's a very broad uh, definition and a broad um, uh, set of research challenges associated with artificial intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of AI, which uses statistical tools that help computers learn from data and relies on these handcrafted features of the data. Whereas deep learning is a subset of machine learning, uh, primarily driven by neural networks, that's learning both the um, uh, making the answers as well as learning the features that are needed to provide those answers. 
And so if we look at a timeline, um, we can see that our artificial intelligence has been around since the 50s. And it wasn't until really the um, 80s and 90s that machine learning began to find its place. And then in about 2010 and forward, deep learning, neural networks um, became really prominent in answering some of these very difficult questions. So if you look at um, uh, going back to the 50s, as I said, AI has been around for a long time and it was defined in the 50s um, as every aspect of learning or other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. This is what was, was sort of uh, hypothesized in 1956. And in 1970, Marvin Minsky um, gave uh, um, an interview, I think it was to Time Magazine where he said, in from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Now, that was, what, 50 years ago now? And you can see that we are nowhere close to having that, but we have still made large number of advances since then. Um, so around 1973 is called the, win the AI winter of 1973, where suddenly people were saying, we've spent all of this money on AI and we have little to show for it. And people were thinking it was, it was dead. We weren't gonna move forward. That all changed in the mid to late 90s when the first applications of machine learning really came out, things like spam filtering for email and optical character recognition. And people realized that this could have legs and could be used to answer a large number of important questions. So that leads us now to the intersection of wireless sensor networks and data science. Um, where these recent advances in data science and machine learning have enabled the analysis and application of this data to provide increased value. And so we see that we have all of this data coming from sensor networks, and now we have the tools and techniques from um, data science to be able to analyze that data in new uh, and different ways, and how do we utilize that? So sensor analytics and Internet of Things, um, uh, the question becomes, Right now, much of the analytics that is done today is on understanding human behavior. Things like consumers purchasing history, website browsing patterns, movie preferences, these are all things we use every day that utilize analytics and data science techniques to try and um, better serve us, find patterns within our human behavior to figure out what to do moving forward and how best to um, support the user and the consumer moving forward. Um, but with the Internet of Things, con connected devices will overtake humans as the most prevalent sources of big data. So moving forward from here, we expect that the data that is being used to analyze and make decisions is not going to come from each of us as it has for the last 10 years. It's going to come from these sensors and these devices that are in the field. And this is leading to this new field that's known as sensor data science. And so there's a lot of interesting questions that need to be studied in this field. What data should we gather? Uh, what types of data? How, how should that data be structured that we're gathering to be able to answer some of these important data science questions and analytics questions? How best do we gather the data to reduce costs? So think about that energy efficiency. I've talked, you know, for 20 years, we've been focusing on how do we be as energy efficient as possible? Well, how do we take some of those techniques? How do we take what we've learned uh, from that work over the last 20 years and now apply it to this new domain of saying, how do we become as energy efficient as possible in getting the data that we need to answer these questions? How do we utilize renewable energy to support big data coming from sensors? So if we know we have renewable energy, you can imagine some interesting ideas coming out of this, like I talked about before uh, with the uh, MIMO system. If there's some devices that have a lot of energy and some that only have a little. What data do you ask of each of them to be able to support overall your goal of um, sensor analytics without taxing your sensor networks and having them lose energy and, and have to um, not be able to provide data when you might really need it? And then, you know, one thing I think that's really interesting and is going to be an important question moving forward is how do we support and how do we do distributed data science to answer the important questions from data. So right now, most data science techniques, you have lots of data coming in, you run your machine learning, your big data algorithms on the data and you get your answers coming out. Well, in a wireless sensor network environment, that costs a lot. 
if you're going to take all of your data from all of the sensors and have it go to a centralized place for analysis, that's not the most efficient approach. Whereas if you could do some distributed analysis, maybe clusters of nodes where you centrally compute some things in a local cluster that you share, how do we think about distributed data science um, to best support the Internet of Things and sensor analytics moving forward? This is going to lead to important new discoveries in this new field of, of sensor data science. And you already have a lot of researchers exploring this new area. So I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, challenges that I think are going to be really interesting in sensor data science that have already been identified. So some of you may have heard about the National Academy of Engineering, the NAE Grand Challenges. This was, and actually at some of your schools, there may be something called the NAE Grand Challenges Scholars Program, where students can study one of these grand challenges. And if they have it at your school, I highly recommend you get involved in the NAE Grand Challenges Scholars Program. It's a wonderful initiative. Um, but anyway, the grand challenges were a set of 14 challenges that the NAE um, came together about 10 years ago now, and, and they got a whole group of very uh, prominent engineers and scientists and thinkers from around the country and around the world, probably, um, to say, what is what are the challenges that humanity faces moving forward in the next century? What are those really big problems that we need to think about solving? And they came up with a list of 14 grand challenges, and I'm going to list them here for you. And um, I, I would posit that all of them are going to require IoT and sensors uh, moving forward. But there's the ones that I've highlighted in red are ones that you can clearly see how um, a sensor network analytics, data coming from sensor networks that is used to make decisions is going to be incredibly important moving forward. So for example, making solar energy economical and enhancing virtual reality, as well as advanced health informatics and restore and improve urban infrastructure. All of these are going to benefit from um, getting data from sensors that can be used to um, improve these and, and, and address these challenges. And here are the last seven of the challenges. And of these, the ones that clearly are going to benefit from um, IoT and sensor data analytics are providing access to clean water. We already talked at the, at the beginning of the talk about uh, a sensor network where you can deploy sensors in rivers and lakes to um, monitor the, um, the quality of the water for pollutants and so forth. Managing the nitrogen cycle and developing carbon sequestration methods. All of these techniques, all of these problems, all of these challenges are going to be addressed and helped and benefited by having access to sensor data analytics. So that leads me to um, the last part of this talk where I really want to focus on uh, the importance of educating the next generation. And as, as a, a professor for uh, 20 years now, and now as Dean of uh, the Hagem School of Engineering at the University of Rochester, this is really a, a, an important um, mission for me to uh, think about how we can educate the next generation, not only to learn fundamentals, um, but also to be creative and globally minded analytical thinkers who are going to meet challenges we are yet to foresee because we don't even know what's coming in the future. The jobs of tomorrow aren't even available today. And I like this quote from George Eastman, who is, um, he, he is from Rochester. He developed the uh, Eastman Kodak Company up in Rochester. Um, and he was a big philanthropist and a big supporter of education. He says that the progress of the world depends almost entirely upon education. And I agree with this 100%. If you look at the, uh, this, this timeline that shows technological advances across time, and you can see that uh, way back in the, the history of, of humanity, um, technological advances happened every century or so, and now they're happening every six months. So the, the pace of technological change has gotten so fast and is going so quickly um, that we, again, we need to be able to think about how do we create our next generation of leaders who can adapt so quickly. And we all know that kids are born scientists and engineers. They love to explore their world. They love to play. They love to understand the world around them. And they love to create solutions. Something doesn't work, they find a way to fix it. That's what engineers do. That's what scientists do, understand our world. Um, and we need to really instill in kids from as young as this age that they should never lose that love of learning. They should never lose that, that desire to understand the world we live in and to create solutions. 
And we need to think about, and, and all of you, I encourage you to think about yourselves as lifelong learners because um, you're never going to stop learning because technology is never gonna stop changing. So once you get out of college, once you get out of graduate school, you're gonna have to continue learning for the rest of your careers and hopefully for the rest of your lives. Um, it's one of the most fun things I think about being a professor is that we're constantly learning new things from our students who come and talk to us about a new idea, a new technique, uh, a new development that they've found. So we're constantly learning as well. And I think it's really important to think about that. As well as I also would like to really encourage experiential learning. I think one of the things that helps people keep engaged and excited about continuous learning is not just sitting back passively uh, listening, but really reflecting on that, uh, what you're learning and, and putting it into practice. That's so important in order to uh, move forward. And of course, I want to uh, really address the issue of underrepresentation that Janice was talking about in the beginning and Cami also mentioned about how we really need to build pipelines and the future uh, of our technology. We're not going to get the best solutions unless we have input and ideas from every segment of the population. And so not only do we need to encourage more and more of our young people to go into this field, we need to broaden our participation and we need to encourage and um, ensure that moving forward, uh, everyone has access to this uh, uh, exciting field, what I think is as, as the most exciting thing you could possibly work on and everyone gets enthusiastic about it and wants to um, go into this field. And I think data science and wireless sensor networks, IOT, are a great, great way to uh, get people enthusiastic, especially young kids, because they can see the power of what they do um, really impacting humanity. And many of us really want to have that impact on humanity. That's what drives us. Um, I want to give a shout out to the BRAID Initiative in Computer Science. The University of Rochester is a member of this. Um, and it, it really, it's an effort aimed at getting more and more uh, young uh, women and underrepresented minority students into computer science. And they've done a wonderful job with that. And I encourage anyone to attend the Grace Hopper uh, conference, uh, the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. That's a great um, way to see really prominent women in the field. I also have to give a shout out to Networking Networking Women. This is a, a group um, that Damla was mentioning. Damla actually leads this group right now. Um, it's a group of over 2,000 uh, members who are interested in supporting and promoting women in the networking and communications field and hosting events at different conferences to um, for mentoring and professional development. So I encourage all of you to get involved because your area is clearly networking and communications. Encourage everyone to get involved with networking, networking women, attend events at conferences, go to the workshops. Uh, it's a wonderful community of women supporting each other. And I always like to end with a little bit of personal information um, to, uh, about how I got onto this path. Um, so my mother was a teacher. She inspired students to enjoy science. And my father was a, a PhD researcher, an electrical engineer. He worked at Bell Labs for 40 years and he invented a lot of uh, speech technologies uh, that underpin things like Siri and Cortana today. So I grew up around technology. I saw how exciting and interesting and innovative technology was. And I also saw the power of education. And that's really what led me to where I am today. So I got my undergraduate degree from Cornell and then my uh, MS and PhD from MIT. And from there, I went straight on to the University of Rochester. And I've been at the University of Rochester now for almost 20 years um, at this point uh, as a professor in electrical and computer engineering. I served as dean of our graduate studies um, across all of art sciences and engineering. And since 2016, I've been dean of the Hagem School. I'm married with a son who is unbelievably 17 years old and applying to colleges this year. And I have a daughter who's 15 years old. Um, and then have lots of interests outside of work as well. Um, I love to travel all over the world. You can see a picture of us here in Mongolia, which was one of our best trips we ever took a few years ago. Um, but lots of things that I love to do outside as well. I think it's so important to be balanced and uh, spend a lot of time work hard at work, but also enjoy things outside of work and, um, and enjoy life and have good balance. And so the last thing, um, I, I, in my last slide, you saw that I'm a sailor. I'm an avid sailor, love to sail. So I think everything about sailing is, is sort of like life. So I always like ending with this quote here. 
from Mark Twain, who said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something. Um, I don't know if we have time for any questions, but I'm happy to take questions either here or feel free to email me if you have questions afterwards. Thank you. Randy, thank you so very much for this inspiring talk. It was great that you actually started with the Sunstone Network where we have been 20 years ago, where we are and where you think you are going in the future. I think the future is very bright and very exciting, I think. And uh, I think this is a great time and uh, for everyone to get involved. So uh, thank you for this great talk. Um, so we have actually just one quick uh, question. One of our attendees was wondering, why does the moats called moats? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Do you, have you heard of, of why they're called? Mo I, that's just in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, they were always called moats. They're not called that anymore, but that's where I grew up with them. So that's what exactly. I always yeah, I mean, this is something that I also never thought of it, and I actually did a little bit of Googling. There's a one company who's actually talk, uh, has uh, moats in their um, um, website, and they say just because they are exciting to be called moats and they are spiky, tiny little items, and so they, but I don't really know myself exactly, but that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was a company that came up with the T moats, the T moat sky, and they just called them moats, and I think it just stuck. I don't know that there was a reason behind it, but I'm going to have to look that up. That's a very Good yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I remember like they were not actually even that cheap when we were trying to buy them years ago, and now they're obviously $1 or, or 10 cents. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, exactly. No, they've come down a lot in price. It used to be you, you protected your moats with everything because you had four or five of them, and that was it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we've definitely come a long, long way. Absolutely. Um, so thank you again, Mindy. I think uh, in order to actually keep up with the time, uh, we are just at two o'clock. I think this is about the time I believe our next panel is starting, uh, and that will be Janice, who will be actually um, doing the moderating. So uh, I. Again, thank you, uh, Wendy, and uh, and for those of you who are uh, joined us earlier, please continue. We have uh, we have continuously exciting program to come forward. So, Janice, you wanna go ahead? Thank you, Demla, and thank you, Wendy, for a great presentation. Um, uh, one administrative issue: some of some people were not able to log in. Please try again. I think there's some congestion with when many people try to log in at the same time. So please try it again. And if you get the message that you need UF credentials, um, if you had that message, please let me know uh, how you resolve that. I think we have another link for people if they're getting that message as well. So I think uh, Zoom wasn't ready for our, 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 our number of attendees this morning or this afternoon, but we're all getting in. So my next task is to introduce the academic panel, and we have a very ex distinguished group. So I will share my screen and provide an introduction for each of our panelists. Let me share this as a PowerPoint. So our four panelists include Dr. Raquel Hill in technology and Harvard University. She has also been, um, she's currently a chair at Spelman College program at uh, Indiana University most recently. Her primary interests span the area of trust and security for distributed and computing environments. Uh, security is a very hot topic, and especially security in electronic voting systems. Her interdisciplinary work has appeared in Forbes magazine, where she revealed that people fill, filling out a, anonymous surveys actually have some data um, stored and revealed, and you can actually determine who those people are uh, by reverse engineering. So that was a very uh, groundbreaking study. Our next panelist is Muriel Medard, she, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, if not, she'll correct me. So she is a Cecil Green Professor in Electrical and Computer Engineering, or Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, 
and she leads the Network Coding and Reliable Communications group there. She is well awarded with many different credentials, um, including um, Gilbreth Lecturer at the National Academy of Engineering, um, Distinguished Service Awards from various IEEE Communications Society and conferences and organizations. Uh, but most notably, she's a member of the National Academy of Inventors and a member of the National Academy of Engineering, which she was just uh, elected to. Uh, our third panelist is Patricia, Patricia Nava, and she is the Interim Dean of Engineering at the University of Texas at El Paso. She has worked in industry for some time, and including at the White Sands Missile Range there in uh, El Paso, or uh, in New Mexico, and as a design engineer at IBM. She became a professor at the University of Texas at El Paso and became the chaired professor or, or endowed professor from the Elect El Paso Electric uh, Company. She is, has been instrumental in leading the Texas Regional STEM Degree Accelerator at UTEP and has done a lot of work for STEM fields and trying to increase uh, diversity in the workforce. And our fourth panelist is Wendy Nielsen. She is the current program director at the National Science Foundation in the Division of Information and Intelligence Systems. She's the lead director in particular in the Smart and Connected Health Program. Her work focuses on the intersection of computing and human functioning, uh, including many of the things Wendy talked about just a short while ago, the other Wendy, um, cyber physical systems, artificial intelligence, robotics, information systems, all very hot topics. And she has been co-chair of the Health Information Technology Research and Development Working Group of NITR and has also been at NIH and has now has been the lead for the NSF NIH Smart and Connected Health uh, funding announcement. So she's coming from a clinical psychology background into computing and engineering, so she provides a different perspective for us. So those are our introductions, and now we'll go to our panel. So all four of our panelists can turn on their cameras and everyone else can turn off their cameras so we can focus on the panelists themselves. And we just have a few questions for you guys to answer. And if there are questions from the audience, then you can type those in the Q&A window. At the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a Q&A window that will allow you to type questions to us and we can ask the panel. So the first question I'll throw out and any of the panelists can um, volunteer to answer. What changes do you see over the next five to 10 years in this technology we call Internet of Things? Is this something that's going to continue along uh, machine learning lines or artificial intelligence lines or is there going to be a breakthrough in development in, the, in computer architecture and, and miniaturization of devices? Where do you see these, this field growing in the next five to 10 years? I can, um, one of the things I think, there, I, there have been significant advances um, as it relates to the internet of things. And we saw this back in um, early 2000s, we were talking about it as ubiquitous computing and pervasive computing and we talked about sensors but really lack the application or the um, the infrastructure to actually support what we were envisioning and so now we actually see things have changed to the uh, internet of things but it's really the the implementation of a vision that was began you know way before now uh, and so we've been seeing these advances over time. One area that I think that we're going to see, um, you know, just um, the need for more research uh, is the area of security. Um, so uh, security is my um, area of specialization. But what we see when we have the development of new devices and products is that security is still often an afterthought. Uh, and, uh, and these devices are being used in ways um, to launch uh, large-scale attacks. If we look at some of the attacks 
on our networking infrastructure like 2016 uh, with the largest uh, denial of service attack on that we had you know to record where there were gigabits per second type uh, network based attacks using iot devices um, one of the challenges then is when you are creating devices without uh, security in mind how then do we protect existing infrastructure uh, from those devices being used as part of an attack right so we really have to evolve how we secure systems how we proactively protect systems in the in the presence of um, insecure products being actually put out onto the market so i think looking at security and securing systems and how we do uh, security for Internet of Things devices, especially when it comes to implantable medical devices, in addition to some of these other devices or things that we really have to try to take into consideration. I want to build on, on the previous comments because I think that's a really, really good point. Um, but I also think that the applications people are thinking of now and the science that's going to drive those applications is really maturing. Um, so the security questions are key and that'll help in that too. But one of the things I see both in the smart communities, I run a program called Smart and Connected Health, but I also am very involved with smart communities, is that these devices are becoming so ubiquitous, so pervasive that they really are becoming a vision for how do we connect things in a way that makes sense. And Wendy was talking before about water and things like that, but I think now these visions of how do we create these and how do we integrate, it's not an IoT um, AI question, but how are they integrated in a way that really can move these application areas forward, which is gonna take a lot of science to do. Um, but I think that people are becoming really there's some really beautiful ideas that are blossoming in this area now um, because these things are becoming accepted, so accepted and so ubiquitous. I do think they also, in addition to the security, the privacy and ethics issues of them are so profound. I did a conference a week ago on health disparities and um, I talked about IoT, but people were really, really disturbed about all the data that is now just being sold. Um, that is in the commercial sector around IoT. So we have to start educating people and, and really thinking about the ethics and privacy issues associated with these devices to really help them get to the next stage. Well, as we see um, increases in applications and security on all levels, is there some uh, killer app or next technology that, that any of you see for the future that will drive some of this innovation and creation in this area. Uh, I actually would like to connect the question you just posed, Janice, to a question I see uh, in the in the chat in the Q and A from Yang Mao uh, about the integration among IoT and five G, and I think that's very related to the points that Raquel and and Wendy made. Um, I think to some extent, when we thought of IoT, you know, we're talking about moats with Wendy before the other Wendy, uh, we, we thought really a set of a little standalone network of things talking to each other, and maybe there would be like some head node that would gather everything, process it, chew it up, and then, and then hand it off neatly. Uh, but I think that if we're really thinking of these as being integrated, and no longer just a bunch of little devices talking to each other, but talking to a variety of other devices, some of them what we would consider IoT, some of them that we're not, then I actually think it's really hard to predict, in my view, uh, what may be some of the applications, because it, it may not be any more completely separate. I resonated very much with what Raquel said relative to, to the security. Um, I think one of the things that will happen uh, in terms of science, as Wendy was saying, is that the way we acquire information will be different. Right now, a lot of the signal processing is fairly um, 
um, fairly generic, right? You sample, you quantize, you know, you bundle it up and off you send it. But if you're really thinking of being extremely efficient um, and you have devices that have become maybe much more specialized, then the whole side of how do you acquire information will be different, how you sample, how you quantize for a particular purpose. Um, how do you take into account the correlation in the measurements across devices? You know, I think all of that will, will, will make the applications very, very different. I, I can't predict what they will be, but it will be quite different. Anyone else? Next one. So we had a couple more questions. Let me check again the Q&A. Thank you, Muriel, for checking that to make sure audience questions are getting answered. Um, let's see, so what do you see as, as a panel, what do you see as the government sort of responsibility to move this technology forward, or even the academic and educational responsibility? Um, since we do have some influence over what students are learning, what's getting funded, how do we focus on on these new advances and moving towards integration. So um, one thing that I think is the academic responsibility is the ethical, um, um, the ethical use of data and the ethical procurement of data. And, and so I think the privacy issue it may be even more important than the security issue because so much data is being collected about us. And one thing I, most of us probably don't even consider being a uh, IOT device are, are, you know, is our smartphone, right? And that smartphone is collecting so much information about us given all the apps and the smartphone is, um, you know, it has so many different sensors. It can sense so much about us. Um, you know, our movement, our activity, our sleep, um, all of those things. And that information can be used to make inferences about our health and well being. And so now we're getting into like medical related data. Um, so I think um, one of the uh, things as uh, academicians that we must. Um, uh, include and integrate is uh, how do we preserve privacy and what does privacy mean? As far as the government is concerned, I think that we need, um, you know, legislature that actually speaks to privacy and protecting the rights of individuals. I, I'd like to actually echo that also going back to the point I was making before that the, the gathering of data, which is right now generic, sort of entails overgathering, right? Because if you're gathering without a purpose, then you will tend to, to gather a lot of data, presumably sufficient, but probably far in excess of what you need for the, the stated purpose. So, so looking at gathering the data, sampling the data, quantizing, and pre-processing the data so that it it doesn't it doesn't reveal anything in a, um, um, a, a in an accidental way. I, I think that 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 links that signal processing aspect to the privacy aspects that uh, Raquel was talking about, being very deliberate in our acquisition of data, which is not the way you know we usually do it in electrical engineering. It's like you just you know quantize and off you go, right? So I, I think it's going to be very different. I also think that there is kind of a requirement to, to continue to teach and build this science just because of, you know, I mean, COVID has made this very clear um, in so many ways, but having having this technology developed that we can we can um, create the next generation of sensing the next generation of inference, um, I think is, is really I know it's I know at the National Science Foundation, it's one of our priorities. Um, is to really building on that science, but but also teaching the students the skills to continue to make us to drive innovation in this area and bring these multiple fields together. I think because of my um, 
acting as institutions responsibility is uh, investment to actually invest uh, excuse me, Dr. Nava, we're having some background uh, noise, I think, where you are. Is it possible to speak closer to the microphone? Uh, there's no background noise here. I don't know. I guess my mic is a broken Sorry about that. We'll try to get that resolved in a few minutes. Maybe um, to turn your volume down might help or something. I'm not sure. Well, use your teaching voice. <laughs> That's right. Do you want to try again, but just uh, belt it out at us? <laughs> well, I thought I was belting it out at you, but okay, I'll try again. Oh, that's uh, much better. Okay. So I think that academic institutions' responsibility is investment. Investment uh, with regard to uh, people who are in that area, hiring faculty and, and developing curriculum, as well as financial uh, investment in uh, acquiring platforms and, and teaching um, relevant software and uh, platforms and uh, devices to take this forward. A lot of times in this area, we see a lot of multidisciplinary uh, interaction and projects. How do we, or I'll ask even the administrators here, the Dr. Hill as chair and Dr. Nava as an interim dean, how do you encourage faculty to um, work across departments, work across colleges, and uh, make something happen where it's kind of inconvenient, it takes a while, and you don't know where you'll get funding, you don't know who's going to get the credit. So how do you encourage people to work together who may not even know what the other one's talking about? You may not even speak the same language. So I've actually done a lot of this uh, working with, um, you know, non-computer scientists, uh, working with behavioral scientists on trying to understand like what data are you collecting? Uh, began working with them um, just talking about privacy and their data and, um, well, security. So going from, for example, a, um, you know, paper surveys to digital surveys. And they were concerned about, well, how now do I protect the data? But not necessarily understanding that there is a privacy issue. And if I have or anyone who has access to the data, they may be authorized to access the data, but what can they learn that the individuals who shared the data with you um, were not aware that they would actually be able to learn about them. Um, so uh, one of the things that I try to encourage uh, the faculty within the department uh, to do is try to solve real problems. Right. I think we can all work within our disciplines and work on a theoretical problem. But um, when we begin to go beyond the walls of our disciplines uh, or our research area uh, and talk with others, we begin to understand that there, there are specific problems that are real world problems that people have. And there is a, a level of satisfaction that you get from helping someone actually address, you know, a real world problem. And real world problems are often harder than theoretical problems because in, in theory, we can, um, we can assume away some of the more complex aspects of the problem. But when someone has an actual practical problem, then it's gonna take a little bit of innovation and ingenuity to possibly address that problem. So, I think some of the reward of trying to address that problem comes when you actually, um, you know, cross the boundaries of your discipline and reach out to others to understand how you can help uh, them address the issue that they have, that they are not equipped by their discipline to actually address. And as we are moving more and more into computation, um, we have to begin to cross those boundaries. So the biologist is not, you know, looking to solve problems, you know, without there being some computational aspect to it. 
uh, the social scientists when they begin to look at data and how data is being used and to identify, you know, food deserts or where there are wa water quality issues, it becomes a data problem that, you know, in order to really begin to understand that problem, there's a computational aspect, right, that may not be part of, you know, their training. So I think, you know, there are a lot of problems out there. Uh, and I think students are motivated by that real problem. And so if we really want to motivate students to begin to look at our discipline, we need to uh, apply the theory to real world problems. Thank you. And I know, uh, Dr. Medard, I know you do a lot of sort of across discipline work and also as well as deep work within your own field. Is there a certain approach you use to, to reaching out to other people to do interdisciplinary work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I wish I had something intelligent to say where I go, oh, I have a plan the whole time. <laughs> A lot of it just happens. It really does. It just happens. Um, I find that I always start from the theory and then um, think that it's going to be, you know, maybe not that bad to take it into practice and then discover it's really, really hard. <laughs> Uh, and then along the way of taking it into practice, I end up just asking um, colleagues, friends, people, you know, well, what, what would you do? And building collaborations that way. Um, and, and so, you know, going back to the previous comment, it really does make a, a huge difference to take things into practice. I try to encourage all my PhD students um, to do at least one part of their of their research in something which is really going to be applied um, because you know that that which is like the praxis of engineering is just not replaceable by anything you know um, um, and I think what it also does is it's 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 not just a one direction you know even though I generally start the theory it's not just okay you go through the theory to the next step to the next step you have to revisit what you did in the theory before having seen oh well actually the real issue is you know <laughs> it's not you know well, the way you are measuring energy maybe it's more your peak energy that matters or you know what you really got stuck because your frequencies aren't correct and that's sort of um, almost dialectic between between the two is is really really fun right that that's what makes uh, what that's what makes engineering uh, really interesting now of course what happens um and maybe this is just a uh, you know just a personal preference i think that one needs to have the ability to go back to the theory right because the theory allows you just to remove a lot of the mess and try to simplify and think of things in ways so that you can isolate, just distill what the problem is um, without dealing with all the other mess and then go back to the messy part. So I think that going back and forth um, is, uh, is really, really fun. And I think in that context, also doing the tech transfer you know, doing the tech transfer, and particularly the commercial tech transfer, um, is unbelievably messy and rewarding. Uh, yeah. um, and I think encouraging our students to think of doing it, not by giving them, you know, a sort of, um, you know, facile, narrative of you know go and do entrepreneurship it'll be great fun and you know you'll be successful more like go do it uh, you will learn tons no matter what you do, what no matter what happens I, I think that encouraging that in the in the students is uh, um, is worthwhile also uh, again with the right caveats that it is it's it's a it's a rough road uh, but a very worthwhile one. Great, thank you. 
And Dr. Nielsen, as someone who's watching panels and seeing people discuss these multidisciplinary issues, what do you find in terms of, of what people are looking for in terms of projects or what's the most, uh, some of the keys to success in, in putting a project like this through? So um, thanks for asking. Um, I think Raquel had it, you know, that often people don't know what they don't know. Um, so you'll be working with partners that don't know what they need or they think I just need to be able to have be able to text message. Um, I remember when I started, it was just we could just text message everything and it all work. Um, then I started working with computing and it was like, oops, uh, we could do a whole lot more, but we don't even know what we can do. But I think it's really helping people understand, develop language. I think it's sharing students helps a lot. Um, I think understanding each other's problems and, and figuring out, um, I often talk about this as a relay race because I can, maybe I can build the app that you need this time, but then I wanna be able to use the data. I wanna be able to expand on it the next time. And um, I think those teams, the building of those teams takes time but it also takes the passion. So don't partner with anyone you don't want to be around a lot. Um, because I think people just think, I feel like I've got somebody who's in my area. That's great. I'll do it. And then it's a lot of work. Um, I think, as Muriel said, it's a lot of work to do this. Um, so finding people that you really like and being thoughtful. I mean, I talk to people all the time about how do you meet people outside of your discipline. Go to, you know, there's PhD thesis. There's, you know, there's all sorts of things happening at your university, conferences that you can attend. Um, I often send psychologists to conferences, to computing and engineering conferences and say, you're gonna feel like you don't know anything, but that's okay. Um, just learn, absorb, listen, and see if there's a partner there for you, you know? As you're watching Raquel or Muriel or, or Patrice talk, Patrice talk, go, oh, wow, she's cool. I understand what she's talking about. That might be interesting and then reach out and embrace those kind of opportunities, but I think they take time and I think they I think students are really the best way to build these bridges. They learn the languages across disciplines so much faster. Um, and then you send them out into the field with a skill set it's irreplaceable too. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. I think I will go to the Q and a board again. There are a couple more questions posted. Uh, one of the questions is, what are some of the future applications of sensor networks slash IoT? Right now we have everything smart, smart car, smart home, smart health. What, what might be the next frontier? I, I'm just going to throw something out there. I, I see some very interesting aspects. Um, happening also in the, the textile industry. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll give a shout out to, um, uh, to uh, AFOA and um, the, the work of my colleague, Yul Fink, in Smart Textiles. But, you know, that sort of uh, integration into, into fibers, you know, fibers that are uh, truly um, soft and flexible and washable, you know, I think that the, those sorts of aspects. Also, I'd like to do a shout out to, to my former student, Todd Coleman, who has a UCSD in, in looking at, um, you know, um, basically uh, entirely flat, you know, just almost just a sticker type of circuits. I mean, I, I think that those those integratable, very soft, uh, flexible, yet sufficiently durable um, uh, uh, devices, you know, integration of devices is, is really, it's, I don't know where it's going because it opens up so many doors, but I, I think that that's going to be uh, very intriguing. Anyone else? See something on the horizon? I think the question of scale is coming up. Um, I think that we, along with the textiles and all of these, these devices that can become um, less invasive is the scale question. Can we do this really at scale? Um, instead of doing a project 
where we can, you know, where we can make, we can work really hard to make it work at a, at a very limited level. Can we really start to nudge some of these things up into a scale? Um, I think that that's where we're getting close to now. Um, and I think we often think of industry doing it, but I th think this is really a research question um, that will really drive a whole lot of new innovation. Thank you. Another uh, question on the board is, what are the views on building IoT devices backdoors? So what are the potential benefits for that and the risks? Oh, there are lots of risk <laughs> with building back doors. Anytime you, anytime you uh, create a door, um, there is a potential violation of access um, to that door, right? And so um, this leads to, you know, many uh, issues if we um, look at some of the legislation regarding you know access to our communication and creating back doors into like our encryption algorithms to gain access to what is supposed to be confidential communications right um, so we begin to violate all kinds of security goals so if i think that i'm communicating securely with uh, an entity uh, an entity being any host on a network, but then there's a back door um, that allows someone access to that communication, then co nothing is confidential. Um, and nothing then is private because I have no control over my information. So then now if we create back doors into I IoT devices, and these are devices that are sensing different things and we're, we're walking around with sensors. We're putting sensors in our home every day. Um, we have, you know, chat boxes and, and everything that we're doing, like, you know, our, um, you know, our thermostats, our smart TVs, all of these things. You know, um, if we put in the back door, you know, if someone has access to it and we have no control over um, these devices that we are purchasing. Great, makes, makes a lot of sense. You see these things in the movies where, you know, you can fix this because you go in the back door, but that's not quite as simple as it sounds. Uh, so the next question in the Q&A is, as most of the big tech companies have their own research labs, do we know how much of the IoT research or theory developed in academia or published in academic papers, how much of that actually ends up in real world implementations and industry? Do you have um, some idea of, of what that transfer looks like or how much is being transferred? I think the uh, the tech transfer question generally is is a very interesting one because it's not always a uh, a sort of a clear path that you can say ah you know somebody published this algorithm and it you know it appeared uh, in transactions on whatever and three years later it was implemented it's you know. Um, so sometimes the way I, I like to describe it, and it's um, it's only half facetiously. It's a bit like, uh, you know, the fashion show. You you see like these, you know, uh, maybe people wearing um, you know, clothes with like uh, you know, shoulder pads out to there. That doesn't really mean that people are going to run around like that in the street, or very few will. You know, it really means that the shoulder pads got a little broader. I mean, I think that what what you know, there, there's a sort of um, uh, again going back to the simplification that that happens there's a sort of simplification and uh, almost uh, almost caricatural example that we give but it actually in 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 research and academic research but it actually does often have a bearing um, on what happens in practice it's just that maybe the the line is not you know entirely um, uh, clear and you know it's 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 a little bit more um, a little bit more um, diffused, uh, but it does it does have if done correctly I think it really does does have a, an influence. 
uh, you can see ideas really being sort of uh, shared and 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 certain notions. I think, particularly design notions or uh, very specific constraints. The idea that certain constraints become important. That I, I think there is quite a bit of um, of benefit there. And I I would like to also um, say that regarding you know that tech transfer. I think like when you think about um, you know like our fundamental research. I think a lot of what we see today uh, in IoT, the, the basis of those products came from probably, you know, pure academic research, you know, from decades ago. But it took industry to take it to the next level for us to really realize that. And I don't think it, that part, you know, to see the smart home we weren't going to see all of that unless we got industry in interested enough that they would make some investments in, in making the uh, circuit small enough and the chip small enough that we could have these census device, sensing devices and, and they could be placed, you know, to scale. Um, you know, to scale this whole notion of pervasive, ubiquitous, now Internet of Things type computing. So, but I think the vision for this probably came from, um, you know, it, it started in academic research. You, as Muriel said, you can't see the one-to-one -one mapping of this paper, um, this product is a result of this paper. Um, but um, it took industry to really take it and invest the amount of money for us to see what we have today. I just want to add, I get to see some really interesting things in reports. Um, so I get to see the science as it's getting disseminated and patents that are being released and all sorts of things. So from an insider's perspective, I'll tell you, I think Rachel and Mary, Mary, Mary have both talked about this, but I get to see it and it's happening. Um, and, and these ideas that are really innovative from the research community are being developed into patents and being, and being built out with industry. And I now have many of the PIs that I work with are coming as small businesses saying, can we build this out? Um, they'll eventually be bought out by larger companies, but, but I think that's how the development cycle often works. And it's not everyone, but it's happening more and more. Thanks. Um, the next question is, again, back to sort of the academic question, is how do we encourage people in academia to do some of these things like uh, start businesses, work in multidisciplinary projects, when they have sort of the tenure and promotion looming over their heads and they want to make sure that they satisfy um, sort of the theory part so that they can progress in their own field at the same time investing all this time and effort into other fields. How would you advise someone to navigate that tight wire? Anyone can answer. I think for junior faculty, right, it's very difficult um, as a junior faculty on a tenure track, you know, with your main goal being tenure to really get into, to begin interdisciplinary work. So it's one thing if you, you're training as a PhD student, you're working on interdisciplinary part uh, projects and you already have the partnerships established and you have a domain expert that you're working with, but you're providing, for example, the computational at, uh, solution to address a specific problem. And so I would encourage, you know, junior faculties who were not, um, you know, coming, who are not coming from an interdisciplinary background to focus on the problem space that they're working in um, to make sure that they are um, meeting the standards required by their department as far as publishing within their discipline. Um, but, and then begin as they are progressing with their research and are on track to, you know, look for those partnerships because it ends up being very difficult if you come in as a junior person and you are spreading yourself too thin 
you know, uh, and not making progress within your discipline. Because you have to be an expert within your discipline or deemed an expert within your discipline, and you cannot be an expert in everything. So this becomes the challenge. You may want to branch out and look at real world problems, but you've got, you need to walk in the door as a junior faculty with that team already in place if you're gonna look at that interdisciplinary problem. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I would say that <clears throat> the junior faculty needs to have a very candid conversation with the administration and make sure that efforts in certain areas will be counted as progress towards tenure. Uh, you know, and I think the advice that Raquel just gave was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and, uh, but, but I would also add, you know, to have what counts because uh, just uh, case in point, uh, our department came through and indicated that uh, patents would have a certain amount of weight towards uh, achieving, uh, you know, promotion and tenure. So I think having candid conversations is, is, the, is the key. I just wanted to say, I think it's Colleen Josephson who asked that question, and Colleen was my undergraduate researcher, and then she, she did her master's with me before going off to Stanford to, to do her PhD, so hi, Colleen. <laughs> um, but I also want to bring up the fact that, you know, the, the, the tenure process, particularly in the U.S., is very tied to letter writing, um, and the letters that you will get. Um, and so it does sort of naturally, unfortunately, send people a little bit more to, to domains where um, they can be more readily identified uh, because, you know, people will ask for letter writers' opinions in a particular area. Um, there are good things about that, obviously, which is why it's done, but there are uh, drawbacks. Um, and that, you know, if you're in more than one area, people may, may only be familiar with one part of your, your, your research. Um, that being said, uh, everything that I'm saying, I, I didn't follow that advice. So do, 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 do as I said, definitely not like I did. because as, as extremely not, uh, not strategic. I think that can be said for all of us. There's the plan, and then there's what we actually did to kind of <laughs> end up where we are, which we are happy with. But just if we if we look back to where we started out and plan to do, it's, it's not always a straight line. So I know um, at least maybe one or two of our panelists may have to jump out because they have some prior commitments. But I wanted to go through the panelists. Um, I think we'll uh, have you guys answer the QA, Q and A's offline, but I want to get maybe a minute or two of, about your journey of how you ended up where you are. So we'll start with uh, Raquel. Okay. Um, I got to where I am. I don't know, where do we begin, right? Um, so why did I become a computer scientist? Math was my favorite subject. And uh, I love problem solving. And I took a, a, a programming class my senior year in high school. And so while I was enrolled in the class, I said, ha, huh, I will be a computer scientist. And in, in, in the case of, of not doing what I did, I only applied to one undergraduate institution, and that was Georgia Tech. And I said that I wanted to go to what I saw was the best um, engineering school and I applied to Georgia Tech and I got in, right? And I did a bachelor's and a master's degree. And one of the great things about being at Georgia Tech at the time was that there were many um, African Americans in the PhD. And when I say many, um, let's say about five, right? And that's um, 
And that was many, that was large back when I was getting my, my bachelor's and my master's degree. And I was there at the time that Dr. Andrea Lawrence was the first, she was the first African-American to receive a PhD in computer science from Georgia Tech. And I was an undergraduate there. And so you, you begin to understand what you can achieve when you, when you actually see it being done. And so I was blessed and I say it was a blessing because I saw it and nowhere else I had never seen a, um, a black PhD in computer science. I never had an, uh, outside of having one professor all my years in college, um, that was African-American. I only had one and that was in African-American history. So to actually be at Georgia Tech at that time, actually it changed my life because I saw what was possible. Um, by seeing Dr. Lawrence go through that process and being the first. And so after getting my master's degree, uh, I was burnt out. You, at Georgia Tech, you don't say when you, you, when you graduated, you say when you got out. So anyone who went to Tech, you, they, you, they will ask you, oh, you went to Tech, or oh, when did you get out? And it's like, you know, you were in prison or something. Uh, it's, it's a tough road. And I got out and I went to work for like three years. And I knew on the first day on the job that, I was going back to get my PhD. It wasn't a bad day. It was actually a pretty good day on the job, but I knew that there was something else that I was meant to do. And after the first year, I applied for graduate school. Um, my company was doing research at Harvard and um, they wanted me to apply and I applied and I went to Harvard. There's a lot I'm leaving out, but um, finished uh, and then did a, postdoc at Urbana-Champaign and there was a connection between Urbana-Champaign and Indiana University and I worked on pervasive in computing with uh, ubiquitous computing with Roy Campbell during my postdoc. My PhD was in networking systems and quality of service and um, so I started looking at issues of security um, with my PhD and worked at sec security in ubiquitous computing environments and um, back in 2003 to 2005. And, um, and so worked at IU and now I'm at Spelman. But, and Dr. Lawrence is still a professor at Spelman. And so, um, but that's kind of how I got to where I am with a lot of stuff left out, but I said a whole lot too. That was great. I'm impressed how you convinced it, but I think we have a lot of meaning in there, a lot of impact. So, um, I mentioned the lack of strategy. I will now illustrate it by telling you exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I, um, you know, they have a lot of kids who are like really interested in math when they grew up. I, I wasn't particularly, you know, I, I grew up all over, mostly South America. Uh, and then to France, my, my background is mixed South American and French. Uh, so we, you know, because of my dad's work, we spent some time in Africa. So I was just in school everywhere. We just land places. They would send me to school. Um, and then I uh, finished my high school in France. And unusually, I came to the U.S. Most people stay in France. I came to MIT and I figured, I, I really had no idea what I was going to do. I figured I'd do math. You know, that seems pretty safe. You don't hurt yourself. Um, and, but I really liked literature. So I was doing math and Russian literature. I actually did both, both degrees and I took a course in electrical engineering. Um, it also looked also fairly safe because I had a lot of friends who were mechanical engineers. I was like, I am not doing blades. You know, I'm too klutzy for that. Uh, and I realized it was a lot of fun, you know, and, um, you know, I liked the rigor of the math, but I liked the more creative side of literature. And of course, engineering has both, right? It's rigorous, but yeah, to create something, there's a design aspect. So um, when I finished my uh, when I finished my uh, master's, I, I stayed on for the PhD, didn't really have very clear career goals. Um, studied something, you know, I was doing information theory and wireless, you know, my advisor had told me the field was dead and I thought, I don't care anyway. I don't really intend to work in this anyway. So I'm just kind of doing this. My, my then husband had been deployed. And so, you know, it was a thing to, to do while, while waiting around. 
finished my PhD. And of course, there was the big wireless boom. So um, I, um, I decided I, I should go to work because uh, I, had, I, I started my family while I was in school. So I had to go and you know, feed the kid um, and literally interviewed two places because they were close to the daycare that I really liked. Um, took the only job that had nothing to do in my PhD because I figured I would learn something new. And again, my long-term goal was not necessarily to work. Um, and so I took a project that like nobody wanted. It had like a police line to not cross because it was in actually in optical security. And, you know, it just looked like it had risk all over it, you know, come here and bury your career in this one. And I thought it's okay. I'm only doing this for a couple of years and then you'll see where it goes. The project went really well. Um, the work on information theory uh, in wireless sort of took off, got a big award. And I found myself a couple of years out of my PhD realizing that maybe I was going to have a career. Um, and it was my friend, Andrea Goldsmith, who was at Caltech at the time, who who's went to Stanford. Now she started as the dean at Princeton, who said, you should think of, in, of academia. And, you know, I came from a family of academics you know, in humanities, but I was like, you know, I was head of academia, this view that that wasn't for me, that I was way too practical and that, uh, you know, academia was a very... Uh, uh, a, a very tough slog, but B, you know, not something I didn't necessarily want to go into. And and I gave it a try and I really liked it. Um, really, really liked it. I, I realized how much I loved working with students, entirely to my surprise. Um, you know, um, and the rest is here I am. Uh, so it was, um, it was definitely encouragement, definitely uh, a, a lot of good luck. Um, and also a lot of really, really fun, intelligent people to work with. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you. So, um, Wendy, what's your journey? I guess I have the same kind of convoluted journey everyone else does. I, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but I actually did start as an undergraduate in engineering because I like the math, but there was only two women in the program. And I thought, I can't do this. Um, I'm a very outgoing woman and I thought, this is not the environment I want to be in. So I went to business and I worked for a long time, came back, got my PhD. And I, I enjoyed my work um, a lot, but I, but I felt constrained by it. And I decided to do uh, science policy and came to the government. I know it's an odd thing to do, but um, I was convinced by, by the governor of my state that that was a good idea to do um, right before I got arrested. So um, <laughs> talk about, talk about a, a weird world. Yeah, no, no, you didn't get arrested because of me. Um, but he convinced me that I really wanted to go to government and then he, he he vanished, but he was right. Um, when I started, I started actually at the National Institute of Health, and um, I accidentally ended up back in technology by somebody saying, there's a meeting on Twitter, does anybody know what it is? And that was 2009. I was the only person in the office of the director that had a Twitter account. So I got shipped off to become the Twitter person. Um, and it didn't take me long to realize we didn't know even the right questions, the right conversations, the right. Um, I was lucky having having had early experience in engineering that to to link up with people who who taught me all sorts of interesting questions. So I was running back and forth between worlds saying, what about this? What about this? And bringing trying to bring the worlds together. Um, I, I then after a while, I was sat in a meeting one time and somebody said, why aren't NIH and NSF working together? And um, I looked at the program director from NSF and I said, lunch um, in the middle of a meeting. How about lunch? Um, I was told don't partner because it's too much work. Um, I think this is the, uh, the, the stumbling through into the right path, which I completely ignored and created the partnership. Um, after a while, I was invited to come to NSF because I think there was an understanding that the partnerships matter. And it wasn't just the partnership with, with NIH, but um, across in, crossing these disciplines and developing the language to work across the disciplines. 
um, I think it has become really important to how we move forward and how we think about that. So I think I'm incredibly lucky. Um, I think I've kind of stumbled into wonderful experiences again and again and again. So I resonate with Muriel's comments. Every time I think I should have gone left, I went right and it was the right way to go. So, um, and now I'm here and I'm, I have, I think I have the best job in the whole world, so. That's great. I was talking to a student recently who was kind of pointing out to me the right way to do something. And I said, you know what? If I did things the right way all the time, I wouldn't be where I am. You know, there's something to be said for branching out of, or following your instinct. So, uh, Patricia, what is your journey? Uh, well, I guess my journey is very different from everybody who has, uh, has commented in that um, I have three degrees in electrical engineering, and um, that, was not my, uh, that was not my original choice. The uh, situation was that I'm the youngest of 12 children, and so money it was really tight. And the only way that I could go to school after high school was to have scholarships. And uh, interestingly enough, I took an aptitude test. And so I was offered a scholarship for electrical engineering, but only if I majored in electrical engineering. And so I actually cried. Uh, but uh, after one semester, I knew I was in the right place. And so it was, it was uh, really good after that. And, um, you know, kind of, uh, well, I guess following suit with the other uh, panelists that indicated that when they were supposed to go left, they went right. Mine took a little bit of a different turn in that I had professors constantly telling me that, uh, that I shouldn't be there. And so uh, in, in my case, you know, I took a defiant turn and I said, well, Yes, I do. I should be here. And uh, I remember one professor telling me uh, that I would never graduate, that I wasn't going to graduate. And I said, just watch me. And I did. And it's interesting because that also is a theme throughout, uh, throughout I think, my life and all of the positions I've held is that uh, individuals uh, are perhaps quick to misjudge me or assume they know my capabilities by, by uh, looking at me or um, speaking to me. And it's only after they have had experience uh, with, with what I can do that they actually become supportive. And interestingly enough, uh, after I did graduate, the same professor who told me I was never gonna graduate and that I should probably look to do something else is the person who nominated me for a scholarship for uh, graduate studies. So that's kind of been the theme throughout that uh, even with leadership positions, I've ended up in leadership positions because they have been uh, quite frankly I I have uh, inherited either departments or colleges that are under stress or have just undergone some very uh, difficult moments and other people don't want to do it or or you know and so and um, people are surprised that I step up and have doubts about my abilities, but you know, I go ahead and and uh, prove what I can do. And so that's been the theme of of, of uh, my trajectory is proving that I can do it. Well, that is really great. I, I hope the audience out there, especially the junior faculty and students, are are hearing uh, what our panelists are saying about sticking to your guns, about knowing what you can do. And if you, even if you don't know what you can do, know what you like, know what you're interested in. And, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, it's only according to what your abilities are and how you can push through. So I know I've been inspired by all of you. I hope everyone out there has. I really enjoyed this panel and uh, I just wanted to thank you along with everyone else for your presence here today. We've had a great time. Um, for the remaining questions, I may send an email to you guys to get some response to send out to the attendees. But I just want to applaud you and thank you for joining us for this time. Sorry to keep you a little bit over. Uh, but we'll sign out this panel session and take a short break. We'll take a break of about 15 minutes and then come into our industry panel at about 3, 15, 320. So thank you, everyone. You don't have to log out, but we are just going to run a, a, a slideshow to show you information about the workshop. 
Thank you.
All right, so it's 3.15, so we resume uh, our workshop. All right, can, I, can anybody hear me? Okay, so it's a 3.15. I think we go back to our uh, workshop and continue the second panel. All right, so let me share my screen. All right, so uh, I'm very honored today to introduce you to, to you all about the, our industry leadership panel. We have pen, uh, four panelists today. Uh, the first one, the first panelist is uh, Dr. An Chen. Uh, Dr. An Chen is a senior director of engineering at the Qualcomm with several years of experience in the wireless industry. And, uh, she has lead the team in research and broader development in advanced wireless machine learning, mobile health, and IoT. Uh, Dr. Chen is also the inventor with over 400 utility patents worldwide. And currently, she is with the Qualcomm Technology Licensing Business, where she leads advanced technology development and drive ecosystem development and strategy. She also had the Startup Innovation Challenge for Qualcomm with the recent focus on the Startup Incubation Program in Vietnam. She also oversees the Worldwide University Research Collaboration Program. Dr. Chen received her PhD degree in electrical engineering with an emphasis on wireless communication system from the University of California, San Diego. So welcome Dr. Chen to our panel today. Too bad that I cannot applaud in my hand, right? And our second, Something wrong with my computer, I'm sorry. Okay, here you go. And our second panelist is Dr. Thompson. Uh, she is a director of research leading the document intelligence lab in Adobe to reinvent the document for the future in the era of AI and machine learning. Dr. Sun is a seasoned technology innovator and thought leader with a 15 plus years leadership in incubating new concepts through the state of the art scalable machine learning methods and tool and developing impact for rapid prototype and delivering comparative technology to market opportunity in cross disciplinary and cross functional team environments. Uh, she also very interested in uh, the research area in natural language processing and distributed machine learning and big data computing and human computer interaction. She also held 22 ESU US patent for the plus publication uh, at uh, the uh, prestigious conferences and journal. Prior to uh, joining Adobe, uh, Dr. Sun was also director of Scalable Data Analytics Research Lab at Sarah's Pack uh, and the group leader of the decision support and machine intelligence at the United Technology Research Center. So welcome Dr. Sun to our panel. The third panel is Dr. Sala. Unfortunately, at very last minute for some personal reasons, she couldn't join us today. Uh, so, uh, so too bad that we miss her today. So our third, uh, our last panel panelist is Dr. Yui Zhu. Uh, she is a director of research at IBM Ireland. So thank you very much for staying up with us today uh, on this panel. So uh, 
So her responsible as uh, her responsibility at the IBM is to drive innovation and grow the world class industrial research organization in AI, healthcare, quantum computing, data privacy, cloud, and all the cutting edge sciences and technology. She also served on the Industrial Advisory Board of the Dyson School of Design Engineering Imperial College of London. Before joining IBM, she also served as the director of IBM Accessibility Research, where she oversaw development of advanced technology to enable accessibility for IBM products, solutions, and services. She also uh, do several work in the IoT-based AI solution for aging. Dr. Zhu was also co-director for AI for Healthy Living, a joint research center between IBM and the University of California, San Diego. Ruzi also played different technical and leadership roles within two decades, a very long time at IBM. Dr. Zhu received her PhD in material science from Rutgers University. She has over 30 publications and is a recipient of several patterns. And she also got the YWCA Twin Award Honorary in 2010, one of the most prestigious awards in the United States to recognize the successful woman executive for their outstanding achievement. So we welcome all of our three panelists to the panel today. And uh, we're going to start our panel. So here the format. I'm going to uh, uh, let audience enter the question, Q and A question to pan, uh, panel, and then we will uh, answer. I would ask uh, our panelists to unmute their microphone because uh, if, when you talk, you unmute. I saw a gap whenever we unmute. So just go ahead and unmute ourselves. Our audience said that they really want to hear some inspiring stories from the panelists. So I'm not going to stop any question now. Each of you may have a couple of minutes to say, to, to, to say something that you think is very inspiring or some personal experience that you think that is something awesome to share. Or the journey to lead to this position or why you still stay in this position or what you think in the future, anything about you that you would like to introduce. Uh, so we we'll go with the alphabet order. Uh, we start with Dr. Jane. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitations to this IoT workshops. Um, I'm very glad to be with you here with the very distinguished panels. Uh, so I've been uh, with the, um, I've been in, uh, working in the area of wireless communications for the last uh, 20 plus years. And it's been an exciting journey, you know, to be, you know, few of the women, you know, in my grad school's day, and now seeing more women in the engineering areas. Uh, you know, I see more young women are coming in and doing amazing things, you know, taking a lot of the leadership roles in, in industries. And I like to encourage, you know, the students who are on these pan, they are joining, uh, you know, this workshops, you know, in addition to, your, you know, honing your technical skills, uh, skill set, I like you to, you know, step up and taking the leadership role and then drive a lot of these key initiatives, not only in the academia, you know, your community, but also as you know, at the company. And then driving, you know, uh, thought leadership and then promoting and en enable other women to be participate and then contribute in this area. All right. Next up, the sun. Okay, hi, thank you. Thank you, my, uh, thank you for inviting me to be uh, part of this panel. Um, yes, my story is, um, yeah, I, I don't have a degree. I'm not doing sensor wireless sensor networking research, but uh, I do have, um, I went to the double E when I in the bachelor degree. And then, um, and so it's more towards a little bit of hardware embedded software. And then I went to the, my master, I went to the pattern recognition AI that was um, uh, the, in the winter of the AI in the early nineties. And um, then I came to United States. I grew up in China and came to United States in 1992 pursuing a PhD because of the is a winter of the AI. So I went into the distributed computing. My PhD work related a lot of a parallelized algorithm and really design the algorithm can be scalable on the multiple uh, large scale distributed computing. So that's kind of related. Um, but the story doesn't end there. Um, so 
And when I joined, um, starting graduate my PhD, and this whole web evolved and really taken over. So being really nothing learned at school can really directly apply. So I have to quickly learn with internet, web, and the distributed computing. And so that was a whole lot of a learning journey. And then when the two, 2007, when the social media, mobile computing come into place, this you know, large amount of the user generated data available. So moving into the machine learning, uh, NLP, computer vision. So looking at this whole user generated data and getting into machine learning and AI again. So recently as a cloud computing and edge computing coming to the place, um, I joined Adobe recently. So I'm really uh, looking at distributed computing from a very different angle. Uh, it's, not, it's not from industrial per se, it's more from creativity, from user experiences. So uh, I do believe the digital, digital world and the physical world are shrinking and they're blurring together. So this IoT is really a great bridge to, to make things happen. So I'm looking forward to the discussions here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sun. Indeed, you mentioned about that you uh, did not work on the sensor and all that stuff, but now Internet of Things is Internet of Everything. We cannot name the yeah. word things, right? So that's yeah. why, and I think, I, the in IoT now integrate very well into machine learning and and uh, and uh, data analysis. So so it's very relevant to this panel as well. Thank with you, students. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Zhu, can you share with yes. us? Story. Yeah, thanks again for, for inviting me and uh, it's a very exciting event here and so uh, yeah, I have been with IBM for 24 years. It's a long time and so um, it's kind of a, I, I would say I'm very, very fortunate to be with such a wonderful company. When I first uh, joined IBM, uh, you know, I was in material science and worked on thin film process and hard disk drive and I planned my career using a term I think many people are familiar with called a climb the corporate ladder, right? You are the newcomer and there are people ahead of you. You look at the ladder, you move up. But the reality it was that it's not really a linear function and it's uh, it's not really a, it's like you know, a corporate ladder. It's more like a career jungle. You need to look at what's the next step. You need to move up and sometimes move sideways and sometimes need to go down in order to go up. So I would say, you know, seize the opportunity. The most important thing is to learn as much as you can because there are new things coming up all the time. As I said, I joined actually the hard disk drive of the IBM. And then, um, you know, a few years later, that became a commodity and IBM actually sold the hard disk drive. But I was very fortunate because a few years before that, I actually moved to the storage subsystems division worked on hardware and also then got into software. And um, when it comes to IoT, like try to make the long story short and talking about IoT, I actually started work in that area about six or seven years ago when I was heading the accessibility uh, research for IBM because um, for those who are not familiar with the term accessibility, that means you make product and services accessible for people with disabilities. That's one mission. Another mission is, can we use technology to help people with disabilities, right? For example, we worked on two projects uh, IoT related. One is indoor navigation. How can you help people who are blind be able to find where they need to go, right? That's one of the projects was fascinating and you know, help people with, uh, who um, can't really you know, see. The second one is called um, aging in place for the seniors. And uh, there are more and more age, people aging. And how do you make sure they actually you know, can live independently with IoT? So basically you, you try to monitor how they live, extract the sensor data to, to understand their daily living activities. Are they normal or abnormal? And how can you sense that somebody needs help, right? So that's essentially how I got, got into IoT. And then about a year ago, I took on international assignment, moved from Silicon Valley and IBM in Silicon Valley in Armadan Research to IBM uh, in Ireland, in, in Dublin. And so our lab started about um, nine years ago and it was a mission for smarter cities. This is when, um, you know, um, IoT wasn't even really a popular word, it evolved later on. And so we, at this lab, we have a long history of working in IoT. So I'm very excited about sharing 
some of the IoT work together with other panelists and also with the audience. And so we can basically explore what's the future for IoT. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Zhu. And again, thank you for staying up late with us. I know in Ireland, it's a different time zone. Okay. Um, my okay, class. You mentioned about the IoT and devices, and just a remind of me about uh, Dr. Chen. You know, he's, he's working right. Qualcomm survives with many, survive with many IoT devices and with a 5G deployment in the future. And uh, also the relationship uh, between the industry and, and the university. So Dr. Chen, what do you think about that? And maybe you can introduce you a little more because I know you get a, a problem when you join with your uh, your computer <laughs> reboot on you. Yes, uh, th thank you for that, me. So uh, at Qualcomm, uh, we have innovate, you know, the technology for cellular communication from 5G to 4G and now 5G. So is starting uh, deploying around the world. It's opened a new platform for technology uh, innovations. So we anticipate that the you know, many new applications and use cases that will be happening in the next 10 years that can transform the whole world's economy. You know, looking like 10 trillion uh, economy. In the standardizations body, we're looking at technologies. Uh, so, for example, you know, we, we think that this technology is going to be the next greatest safety uh, beside the airbag inventions for automotive, uh, because this capability is going to allow you know the car communicating to the car, the car communicate to the pedestrians, to the infrastructures, to the cloud, keeping the users safer, and then you can be able to want a driver uh, that uh, you know to be able to break much faster, you know, because it would because due to blind spot, for example. And then with the in terms of from IoT perspective, you know, uh, with the new technology that 5G bring uh, forward, we can see, you know, ultra reliable latency, for example, you can get like latency down to like sub millisecond uh, at a five nons reliability. Just think about that, you know, be able to do that over a wireless channel just open up so many different ways of, you know, for new use cases and applications, you know, from remote surgery, you know, to virtual reality that, you know, that you don't have any type of, you know, uh, that sickness uh, due to the latency of updating the rendering. And then we talk about, you know, in terms of massive IoT, you can, you know, uh, 5G is going to bring, uh, uh, you know, forward the technology and the platform to be able to support 1 million devices per square kilometer. So I'm very excited, you know, that, you know, all these technologies are coming, you know, and making a platform available for innovations. Thank you, Dr. Jane. You can see that she has a strong passion and excited for IoT, right? So if we, I think that you hear the question before from the other panel, but I still want to read the question. With all the assignment and, 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 and belief in the technology, either IoT or AI, right? What do you think the next killer app for IoT or AI in the industry? You just, you mentioned it, right? But what yeah. do you think the killer app? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be a single killer app because IoT is a, such an interdisciplinary field. It requires so many uh, uh, integrations of different technology. Uh, and then it serves a different vertical, all right? So, you know, you can talk about smart city, manufacturing, retail, you know, healthcare. So I think, you know, the next killer app will be addressing uh, the need for that particular sectors, you know, that vertical. And uh, it has to be an integration of all these uh, different technology, but in a seamless way that also address, you know, uh, in, in, uh, things like computing, Right, you know, are you going to address doing computing on the cloud or at the edge? Are you going to do data privacy, data security? And it has to be seamless and work, you know, as part of our environment, you know, as part of our daily life. It's not have to be non intrusive to make that a killer app. And I think, you know, I'm encouraging the students, you guys are going to be the inventor of the next killer apps for IoT. 
you know, and we're looking for that innovations because, you know, nobody knows what that kill us at. And, you know, we as an uh, industry, um, you know, uh, technology, you know, inventors here, we're looking for you guys, the younger generation coming up and then using that platform to come up with, you know, uh, these uh, killer use cases and uh, applications. Yeah, just add on what Anne May just said in terms of killer app. I agree with you. It's more solutions and what kind of problem are we going to address, right? Instead of like one single killer app. Um, there are many verticals you already mentioned, different industries. I'd like to mention one uh, area that we recently really put a lot of focus into it. Because uh, there was one IBM product called, uh, you know, Building Insights. Historically, it was designed to take a look at uh, where we can for the energy efficiency to work in the building with different sensors. Now with COVID-19, many companies say, okay, let's return back to work. But then how do you essentially make sure that people keep social distance? How do you make sure your cafeteria or canteen are not overcrowded with people, right? And so we came up with a solution that take a look at, okay, building insights, how can you optimize the, uh, the layout of the office space and also make sure that you don't have hot spot where people cluster together and it cause problem. So that's, that's an example of how can you apply different, you know, not only IoT, but also optimization mechanisms and um, come up with a solution to make people feel comfortable returning back to work. That could be one of the killer apps in, the, uh, in today's uh, COVID-19 situation, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, and on the top of COVID, uh, go ahead, uh, Tong. Sorry. Go ahead, Tong Chen. Tong Chen. So one of the things I didn't talk about COVID, uh, you know, uh, we have seen one of our partners come up with very creative solutions using uh, video, so, you know, uh, on the camera. So they would, uh, you know, at our, uh, in our front uh, uh, desk, you know, when the, we have guests coming, uh, you know, registers to be arrived at Qualcomm and people tend to congregate to that area. So now they have a video camera where they will be able to do uh, using uh, machine learning and AI and computer vision to automatically detect whether people are closer than six feet distance apart and then alert the receptionists to tell them, you know what, you got to separate even though you're wearing masks. So there's some pretty, you know, interesting uh, application use. Thank you, Dr. Sun. I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. It's okay. Uh, so I think so what I want to add on is really, instead of asking what's the killer app, is really looking into two things, right? One, we are in a new era. This is a pandemic. So the post-pandemic era is coming up. What are the untapped opportunity which is not existing before now is coming to us more in imminent? I think both panelists touch on that. The other thing is really thinking about what area is untapped opportunity. Untapped means um, there's a way, traditional way, the status quo, right? So we're doing things like this for many, many years. You know, we don't, we don't even pay attention to it. So one of the things I, I really want to touch is being on the creativity. I know Adobe is well known for Photoshop, right? For Acrobat. A lot of this in the creation space, the multimedia creation space. So what does that mean for post pandemic? So people are collaborating from home remotely. Um, so how we enable these collaborative creations um, so from wherever you are. Things we do traditionally, when we want to write your paper or you want to write, a, a, you know, a text, you know, you want to write the messages, you have to use in the phone or even go back, you know, go back to your laptop, open up Word documents is using the keyboard, right? This traditional interactions has been really dominant. We never thought about, you know, going in, if it's everything is IoT, it is the internet of everything, is any new way of we creating? Are we writing articles in different way? You know, I can even walk during my walk, during my commute or during my driving, I actually can compose in my story, right? In a multi-sensory interface. So, um, so I think really looking into how to helping people create together uh, in the new, not doesn't have to be physically together. Um, this is going to be a untapped opportunity, I think, especially in the post era, post pandemic era. All right, so from the way you all share the opinions, it's talking about opportunity, uh, what you can address, then it comes to my mind and maybe the audience about some 
take advantage of opportunities and do some startups, right? So uh, the audience out here, some of them is a student and some of young professor as well. Do you have any advice if to take that role on startup when still pursue PhD or when still pursue the professor track? What did you think? Because you was working in industry for long, right? You have an idea of how challenged the startup company look like. Uh, anyone want to answer? We don't need to go with order. We get order become boring and pattern is boring, right? <laughs> So it's a question about, I mean, start, I, I start a new company and, and run startups? Yes. Yeah, but um, IoT, first of all, IoT is a very broad area, right? It, you know, from devices all the way to applications, all the way to infrastructure. I think you have to take a look at it. Where, the, where, you know, where are the opportunities? And also um, where you have the lowest entry barrier? Because if you work on devices, for example, may require some capital investment and if you just say focus on the analytics part of it, maybe there are a lot of competitors. So uh, you need to, and also uh, certain areas, um, and I think uh, Anne May also mentioned it before, like the industry vertical, they can be applied in healthcare, can be applied in automotive, can be applied in smarter cities, can be applied in say manufacturing 4.0. If you're thinking about applications in a particular industry, then you also need to acquire industry domain. You need to have connections and they need to understand what are the specifics about you know, IoT in this, in this area. So I think a different consideration you have to see um, you know, where the money is, in, you know, where the, uh, the VC is investing money and also what's your strengths and what's a competitive uh, landscape in order for you to decide, okay, you know, here is maybe I can, there is an area I can, I, I have niche and I, I can start a startup. Thank you. You are on mute, not a jam. We couldn't hear you. Or something, our microphone had problem. We still cannot hear you. Okay, well, Dr. Chen is uh, changing. Um, I, I can, can I jump in? Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah sure. actually, right. I just had a recent my conversation with my daughter. She's a third year in UCLA. Uh, she was also studying at home because of COVID. And she was asking the same questions. She wants to start up a company. So one of the things I will be in conversation during the walk is really tying to what problem you try to solve. Right. So uh, what target, what user you are looking at, what type of persona you're looking at. The other thing is uh, uh, young generation, especially in the college, when you want to go into the, they, they look at so many successful startup, right? Unicorn, like Facebook, Instagram, they are thinking about develop a certain things can be applied using by millions of people. That is a wrong perception. So one of the things I talked to my daughter, picking a problem, you need to have a minimal viable target audience. Maybe 10 people. You scale that and start really develop the things for this audience. You don't long tail because it's after the, this whole revolution about cloud, mobile, AI, innovation is going to be the long tail. It's not going to be the unicorn going into the future. So Target, find out your sweet spot of your user. It doesn't need to be millions of people. So we are talking about the scale. Maybe the success could be 1,000 user grow into it. So anyway, so decompose. Uh, you are really having, picking the right problem, the problem selection, and know who is your target audience and just keep showing up and keep delivering the value to that audience and your success. Thank you. And Dr. Jane, can you come back now with your microphone? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I want to share with you my journey. So I saw, uh, after I finished, uh, you know, grad school works, you know, I just had that itch to work for, you know, I want to really test out, am I, you know, geared to working for big company or, uh, or go to academia? And so I tried out working for a big company. It just didn't fit me. So I went and worked for a startup, you know, and uh, you know, and I spent many years just also, you know, in grad school, just doing research as well. 
And, you know, and now I'm actually running a startup incubation program challenge that we have, uh, you know, in India, uh, Taiwan, and uh, recently in Vietnam. So I'll tell people, you know, the, uh, the student, you need to figure out what, what actually fits you. You know, uh, you can actually do research also in, uh, in, in industrial environments. You know, there's an R&D center so in most of the big company. You can do research there. But the research there is a bit, uh, I would say, more comfortable than the research that we have in academia because you don't have that pressure of getting grants and et cetera. And then you tend to do more applied research than do, you know, in, in the academia. But in terms of startup, you know, you need to really have that passion to make it uh, work because uh, startup is really hard. I remember when I was at a startup, I was with two startups and I worked seven days a week. And the days that I show up, I actually wear the wrong shoes to work. And people told me, ah, today is, uh, you know, April Fool's Day or something. Why are you wearing different shoes? Because I was just so, you know, in my head, you know, trying to solve a problem and then showing up to work. Do you all hear her or only me? I cannot hear you. I cannot hear her either, my. Uh, hello, Dr. Chen. We, we lost you. We, I know you're talking, but we cannot hear anything. No, no, we still cannot hear you. Maybe something wrong with your microphone or the setting of Zoom using different microphone or something. We, we, we still cannot hear you. Can you hear me? We, <laughs> Dr. Chen, we cannot hear you at all. Okay, too, too bad, that's a, a technology problem. That is a, one a problem on a Zoom, right? Meeting on Zoom. Uh, so I was eager to hear uh, the whole story of, of Dr. Jin Shea about her startup experience. Uh, but uh, hopefully you can come back a little bit later, Dr. Chen, when, when your microphone is working again. Um, so let me pick up uh, one question from audience um, we, before we go back to some other questions. So one audience asked, what do you believe are some potential limiting factor to the growth of the IoT in the industry? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. And then, so I think our is IoT research C is the scale, uh, is the bottleneck at the scale. And one key aspect is security and privacy. Um, this is also the core issues to me, right? With all the sensors in the physical world and uh, the user, what is user com comfortable with that kind of intelligence and data collection and mining? Um, so what is the use of privacy? I know the when new generation grow up, their notion of a privacy may be very dramatically different from our generation. But, um, but it is still biggest concern. Um, are we doing the right thing uh, with the right reason um, for right purpose? So I think in order to scale up, it's not a technical issue. Most of these are policy issues, society issue, um, much deeper. I think this is also need a lot of constant dialogue. I know people spend a lot of, um, even in AI community and ethics, AI, um, safe AI, I think without that good policy and good understanding, IoT is not the, the scale of the IoT growth is not in the technology realm. I just, yeah, that's my kind of a five cents. Uh, how about you, Dr. Zhu? Yeah, so I'd like to share also uh, some of the limitation we're seeing today. And so uh, there are multiple dimensions, right? And some of them is actually the devices, for example, the interoperability and standardization. And so, we can easily analyze data. And also the other one is, um, you know, I mean, for example, some of the sensors are still kind of limited. You need to put batteries in there. Uh, we did an aging project with a, a senior center. 
you deploy all these sensors and we saw the batteries will last for six months, but some died within two months, some last for six months. And also installation of sensors, sometimes, for example, you put a motion sensor on the wall, people walk by and knock it off. So when we get into those kind of a practical installation, there are all sorts of problems and we try to solve dealing with before we even collect data and try to analyze data. Then you get into situations where, you know, sensor A coming from one company and sensor B come from another company and they don't really necessarily interoperable. And some companies don't really give you the open API, allow you to get data directly from sensor. They have to go through their cloud coming to you, right? So these are, I would say the industry standard and also collaboration interoperability problems also inhibit uh, the, uh, the scalability of, of, the in, of the IoT. I would say another one is also the skills. And uh, I mean, there was no such thing as you major in IoT because IoT covers so many, you know, it's, it's a very wide spectrum from education perspective. So um, find the right skills, working on the right problem can also be a challenge. So these are basically based upon our own experience of working in the space for quite a few years. Add on what Dr. Yu said. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I totally agree. One of the things that I see the impediments of the progress of IoT is uh, uh, in terms of lack of standardization. So, we see a lot of fragmentations, you know, of different companies of pushing their own, uh, if you will, you know, their own way of the. Dr. Chen, you're now on mute. You put yourself on mute. Yeah. Somebody, uh, the host muted me. So can you hear me still? Yes. I, uh -huh. I think your voice will break up so uh, nothing mute and unmute too much so that we can pick up your voice again. I see. So I mentioned that, you know, a lot of fragmentations on IoT due to lack of standardizations because each uh, company are pushing their own way of implementation. So I think as uh, uh, industry leaders, we need to come together and then push for standardization so we can get that interoperability you know, across the different platforms. Uh, you know, to, to solve these problems. And then, you know, in terms of addressing the infrastructures, I, I tell, you know, I have deployed, you know, one of the IoT projects for Qualcomm, you know, internally for doing asset tracking. Qualcomm, we have many uh, mobile test devices to test our latest chipset, you know, 3G, 4G, 5G chipsets, you know, and we have, you know, billions of dollar assets, you know, from the latest 5G equipment. So I, you know, when I was in uh, corporate research, they reached out and asked me to build the system for them. But one thing that I learned from building that system from scratch is that you have to really understand the use cases, like Dr. Yu mentions, how are they being used in the field? And then make it robust so that it will uh, it will sustain itself. You know what is the battery? How are you going to be addressing the battery? Place it, and it's going to be sustainable in terms of you know uh, the way of you know refl uh, replenish the the, in, uh, the batteries uh, on uh, you know for that system. So the system that I build right now tracking half a million devices around Qualcomm, and we've been using that right now looking at you know tracking visitors that are visiting our campus as well. You know, are they allowed to enter other area? But uh, I think come down to you know what uh, Dr. Yu mentions. You know, if you're working on IoT, you know we need to uh, you know go in and roll up your sleeve. It's not like an academic problem that you sit back at your desk and try to solve it, but really go down there and under the you know, understand the use cases, the requirement, and the deployment itself. All right, thank you. So we can see that uh, we suffer several limit uh, uh, factor right now, right? From the privacy, interoperability data and, uh, and scalability and also get your head dirty, right? <laughs> to, yeah. uh, to get more real world problem. Uh, but uh, back to the data privacy, one not controversial question here is, do we really have privacy nowadays? When we don't even know where the data, our data, we don't, we lose our ownership. It flow everywhere, like for Facebook, you lost everything you tap there. Google, you search everything, you don't know the tracking, everything. Do we really have privacy now? They can hack, you know, they can hack to your camera system, right? At home, you may not even know somebody more to you right now, instead of you use your own camera to monster the environment, right? So what do you think of that kind of controversial question? 
Yeah, I can actually, I mean, talk briefly about it. I would say um, privacy comes to come, you know, uh, comes from two dimensions. One is a government policy. Like now I'm in, in, uh, in Europe and I realize, okay, because the privacy law is a lot more stringent here than other parts of the world, right? It, it varies from place to place. And so I think that's one is government policy. How much are we willing to sacrifice privacy for some convenience? And how can we essentially make sure the government put some kind of policy in place? That's one thing. The second is, as you mentioned, can they hack and, and can you know, people um, compromise their data? And so that's coming from technology perspective because not only um, they can attack data or, or hack data, but on the other hand, even AI models, there was a whole um, study or research on the, the robustness and also security for AI as well. So from technology perspective, that's also there was a gap in terms of how do we make sure the data is secure, the AI models are secure. So that's essentially uh, my view on, on, uh, on that issue. Yeah, I think um, to build on that, and uh, the, the privacy is a very overloaded term. So uh, it may be mean ma many different things to different people. But I think one of the key aspects, just uh, a tie, so my, just you mentioned, um, the education for people know how many data they have, you know, the trails they leave on the internet or the apps. Um, so having that really education, let them know what the data they leave behind. Um, it's very important and how we make sure they're informed, the user informed, the data they generated actually, people are tapping into it. That's one of the very important dimension not many people have been talking about. The other thing is about, um, uh, I think both panelists, Dr. Chen and Rui, was pointed out as a technologies um, on both many different level, data, model, and the physical sensor device itself. Right, this uh, um, this is a protection layer or defense layer. Um, so ho holistically, and interoperability come into the place. And also, a lot of machine learning AI need data annotation, right? So uh, need the human eyeball so uh, to annotate the data. So what would be um, is any way we can mining the inside without human annotation? That means the inside level is the privacy, differential private. Uh, already, right? So, uh, so you can have insight, but you don't need to know the the private data. So, this is all the different angles of uh, privacy. Is definitely cross disciplinary, and is a uh, it's beyond. Sometimes it's technology problem. Some is is a societal problem, education problem, policy problem. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. Technology problem, society problem, educational problem. Because some people just don't care about their privacy as well. Upload everything. Right on the Facebook, for example, I and mean, when we talk about privacy, they say, who cares? If I'm transparency, everyone transparency, why I worry? I heard that kind of question back from a teenager themselves as well, right? Why you worry if, if everybody transparency, then what happened? Uh, okay, so I think, thank you to the panel to give us a lot of different opinion and, and your point of view about RT and e technology. I want to ask a little bit more as a personal question. Uh, because, you know, audience always want to hear some inspiring stories from the, pa the panel, okay, especially this is a woman in our two books up, right? Uh, so, to women, the, the model role, the mentor and model role is very important, right? Uh, so, can you share with us how did you find the mentor or how you, or your model role? And what do you think, it was it difficult as a woman in the last female field to find the mentors or can you share with us? your experience and advices? So Dr. Zhu, want to say? Sure, yeah, because I was looking at, you know, Sun and also and May and to see if they like to share. And so um, mentorship in IBM is a big, big thing because I mean, you know, when you when we have new employees come on board, we typically encourage them to uh, get mentors, right? And uh, now I'm also a mentor and also a mentee. Uh, throughout my career, I always have wonderful, wonderful mentors. So I would like to share with you, mentors are not somebody in your reporting chain. My manager, of course, you know, I always have access to him or her. So I don't need this person to be my mentor. Mentor got to be somebody who can be like an independent sounding board and also doesn't have any conflict of interest, right? They're not really, you know, in your reporting chain or working on your project together. It's somebody can really ask with independent opinion. And also throughout your career and different stage, you need different mentors. 
And as you grow your networks outside of your own company, I would also highly recommend you have mentors in your own organization as well as outside of your organization. Um, I think also being a mentor is also tremendously helpful because I am always amazed how much I learn from my mentees. So when it comes to mentorship, I would say, you know, both try to find the mentors and also do uh, the mentor as well. Um, um, you'll be surprised how, how much willing people are normally very willing to help people when you go, just be, you know, don't be afraid, just ask. When you see somebody have a good chemistry match and also you want to make this person your role model, just ask, would you mind uh, being my mentor? I, get, I guarantee you the answer would be yes, because I've never get anybody rejected my request to be uh, my mentor. So uh, uh, extremely helpful and I highly recommend. Yes, that's a very important question. Just ask a lot of us, especially the young uh, people, afraid to ask, right? So just ask, be brave. Nothing wrong with asking. All right, I saw Dr. Sun also about to open her mouth. So you want to say something? Yeah. Yes, I just want to really build on what Rui said. It's, it's, it's great. I think there's a many company, especially uh, large enterprise, they all have a really good funded, well-funded mentor. Uh, the other thing is, um, I've been very benefit from that as well. I'm also mentoring other, you know, young, um, young junior uh, females or non-female. So one of the key things I learned from mentor, I have a mentor in my different stages of her career inside and outside the company. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't ask for it, but I was being put into it. But later on, I realized because I'm originally, I'm very self-contained kind of, you know, I don't want reaching out to people. And really it's about the comfortable, open up yourself and building the relationship. Mentorship is all about building relationship. Um, so one of the trap you want to avoid is, oh, I want to be a mentor so I can get to a certain position. Don't do that. Actually, um, at, when I, actually, when I uh, first, when I have, I have a, one of the greatest mentor is a male, okay? And he's in the Xerox and he's actually the original was a park CEO in, at the Palo Alto and we are not in the same organization. And he's on the mentor network. I'm on a mentee network where they try to do this matchmaking. And, and he actually put out, um, I asked him, say, I, I, I want you to be a mentor because I like the way you handle the conflict and then your confidence, you know, you, you are very calm. So I pointed out what I really see the property in him. I really want to learn from him. And, and then he gives a specific and say, if you are looking for any next role or position because you want to mentor with me, you are finding the wrong person. He wrote that in his, uh, in his um, uh, mentor network. I say, yeah, that exactly. I don't have any goal or role or promotion position in my, because um, so I, I just want you to learn what your uh, merit in. I think this is great because we are building a great relationship lasting over a decade now. So um, the reason is really don't be too purposeful. Think you get a mentor in order to get a per certain position, that is a trap. I say, uh, stay away from that and really anchor what Rui said, um, looking looking mentor outside of your company, um, the places you can learn, keep the mind of learning, the uh, lifetime learning. Mentor doesn't have to be a person you talk to them regularly, could be just 30 minutes conversation, that mentoring. So uh, don't confine the mentor has to be somebody helping you to achieve a specific goal. Uh, always open up building the relationship and the learning. I think that's the key. That's, that's really good. good. Good suggestions. So uh, one thing I want to add on that uh, is that, you know, when you seek out uh, mentors, you don't need to have to get a mentor in your discipline. You know, maybe sit out uh, mentors that are maybe in different fields. You, maybe you need to develop your uh, soft skills. You know, so one of the things that when I was, uh, you know, going through from an individual contributors to uh, as, a, uh, as a technical lead, you know, my manager told me that you need to learn more about your soft skills. Your hard skills are good enough, but you know, need to how to work with people. And so, you know, uh, go out and seek people that help you, to, uh, you know, to hone those skills. So, so I think, you know, some, you know, uh, 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 Dr. Yu mentions that IBM has a very extensive program for mentors, mentorship. So some, some company may not have that, but it's, uh, it's imperative for you to go out and seek those uh, mentors. And I think it's up to you to put in the time as well, 
because you know it's a relationship that you need to do investments on it because if you don't invest time it's not gonna you know you know, get something out of it and uh, i think you have to be genuinely interested in building that relationship to make it work thank you for all the advices so the key point here that don't scare to ask not afraid to ask don't come with a hidden agenda and don't confine yourself to one area open to another area and then invest your time into it, right? Uh, in order to have the healthy and uh, mental relationship. All right, so I have one last question for the panel. Very specific question. I mean, very personal question. Uh, like for the last one, right? All right, so you all come to today, very long journey to get to this leadership skill. You, of course, you have to go through many things. Could you please share with us if you can remember any specific experience of where you wish that you have done something differently if you was able to do it again? I, I, let me share something. I, I think one of the things is not, do not doubt yourself. So I have passed on a lot of opportunity in the past, you know, where people have approached me say, you know what, I have this great role and I think you're ready to take that big leadership. And I look around and say, you know what, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I need to build more technical leaderships and, you know, and people management skill. And they said, you know what, we can coach you. But I declined a lot of offers in my career. And they said they're going to be willing to be there for me to coach me. But I just have a lot of that self-doubt you know, that, you know, maybe I'm not ready. What if I fail miserably? I just want to make sure I'm get ready for that role, right? So, you know, I think, you know, one of the things, you know, women, we tend to, you know, have that tendency that we want to be super, super ready to, uh, you know, to, before we go and take a job you know, jump into it and then work really hard and then seek out for mentor to provide you the support, uh, you know, and then if you make mistake, you know, then learn from it, you know, so that would be my advice. Zoom. Yeah, sure. So I think I, I, I actually had a similar experience in the past. I still remember because, as I said, I'm, I'm actually a hardware person. And so um, when I was in storage division, one day our VP came to me, say, hey, Roy, I need to work, need you to work on a software product. My immediate answer was like, no, Doug, I'm a hardware person. So I went out of his office. Luckily, my manager essentially stopped me and said, hey, Roy, when a VP asks you to do something, you never say no. So I went back to Doug's like, okay, whatever that project is, I'll take it. That turned out to be one of the best projects I had in IBM that was a storage virtualization. So that sort of shifted me from a narrow area, hardware, into um, you know software area. And later on, I had the courage to pick up other um, different areas. So I think I agree with uh, Dr. Chen just said, you know, don't say no and uh, just, you know, trust yourself and um, pick up and learn new things. Dr. Sun? Yeah, it's amazing. I feel like the three of us agree on, uh, <laughs> all have a similar experience. I think that's maybe tell a lot of story in terms of, um, of us to about being um, willing to jump out of your comfort zone. So one of the key things is, is lifelong learning for me. If I decide to change in a job or any within the company or not, I always ask him, is this something new for me? Uh, is anything I can learn new? If this is the same old things I probably was will pass down, I always want to learn something new. And thinking about uh, really um, what type of who you are and um, some people really want to go into a one area, go deeper and some is a T-shape, right? So I feel like, um, know who you are. I feel like I'm a really a connector. I'm connecting the dots, that's my strength. So, uh, so that's why I keep jumping from, um, I mentioned at the beginning, from hardware, double E, into AI, and then go to distributed and into machine learning. And now with all this large scale NLP problem, I coming back to the parallel, right? Looking at how we train the large language model in more efficient, kind of a circle uh, and, that, um, the breath and, and the next technology is going to be fast paced you will never catch up so keep in mind growth mind in learning lifelong learning um, try something new you never tried before 
Yes, and I also agree, being a female, you know, we can have a little bit hesitation and perfectism in mind. You now, if I do that, that, can I do it perfectly? If it not, let wait for a little bit, right? And I like the word lifelong learning. It's really machine learning for you, <laughs> for lifelong learning. Uh, so, yep, yeah, it's very good, uh, inspiring stories for the, the, that you all share with us today. And thank you very much. I think we're a little bit over time at four ten right now, uh, so we need to wrap up uh, so that we can break into uh, several room uh, for the poster presentation. And uh, again, thank you very much for all your answer input and be here today. It's, I'm very glad that you can make it today. Thank you, Mai. Thank, thank you for you. hosting. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for thank hosting. You. And we all very nice Maria. meeting with you, Dr. Zhu and Dr. Sun. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah nice to meet you, Dr. Chen. Really. And yeah. this afternoon, we will going to invite you all over for for a dinner. <laughs> we could have a virtual dinner. <laughs> yes, a virtual dinner. Yeah, it would be breakfast for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you again, Janice. All right. Very thank nice you. Nice to be uh -huh. very thank nice to be part of this panel. Hey, bye. 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 So thank you, me, for the industry panel. I think that was really great. Um, you know, as Zoom goes, we have technical difficulties sometimes, but we were able to pull it out and make some adjustments. So hopefully everyone was able to hear all the great uh, advice and uh, stories that everyone was telling. Uh, this, just as a program note, first, I'll, I'd like to thank everyone who participated today, the uh, keynote speaker, our welcome from our, our dean, our ac academic panel, our industry panel. It's very, been very great and very informative. Um, uh, we're very grateful that you spent some time today to, to talk to us. The um, whole webinar has been recorded up to this point. So hopefully we'll be able to get that uploaded very soon and send a link out to the people who registered and or we'll just post the video on the NEM, NELMS website so people can see what we did today and enjoy the webinar um, as we did. Let's see, so I don't have much more to wrap up other than thank you again for the attendees who registered and those who were able to come, even though people had to come in and out, we've had a lot of attendees come. We'll send out a feedback form and we'll also send you, as I said, the, the link to the video. But right now, Tempest Neal is going to give us instructions on how to get to the student posters. They're very excited to present these to you. They worked very hard and they created YouTube videos, so they're ready to show what they know. So Tempest, can you show us uh, how to get to the, to, or tell us about the student posters and when we close, you'll see the links of how to get there. Absolutely. So I'm sharing my screen now. Let me go ahead and, can you guys see the, the slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So it's just a, well, one quick slide here um, to direct you to the student poster session. So we received a total of 11 abstracts. Um, 10 of those will be presented to you over the next hour. All of them have contributions from um, a female, either that is through authorship or um, a female advisor, maybe um, a faculty advisor. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're going to have five um, Sessions that are going to be held in parallel, all of them are going to have a, um, a host to moderate the session from one of the co-chairs. Um, the posting session directory is going to be available to all of the attendees through the link of a tinyurl.com slash student posters. So if you go there, you're going to be able to go directly to the poster itself that you can download as a PDF. You'll also be able to find the YouTube spotlight uh, video. You'll also be able to go directly to the Zoom link to view the individual poster session. Um, each student poster is going to be allocated 20 minutes. So you'll have 10 minutes from the author, their, um, their overview, their work for you. So we're trying to simulate the um, in-person poster sessions where you'll be able to walk up um, to the, the student and interact with them. So in this case, we're gonna allow the students to just overview their work and give you um, a brief summary of what they what they did um, what they did, and then allow Q and A for ten minutes. Um, so you can jump in and out of Zoom sessions. Feel free to um, use the student. Um, I'm sorry, the poster session directory to um, go in and out of rooms and figure out you know what you want to listen to, and um, feel free to browse the YouTube links as well. 
Um, at the end of that directory, the last column is a link to rate the posters that you um, listen in on. Um, make sure that you do that so that we can use those ratings to figure out who's going to get the award for the best poster for this year. And then again, for the YouTube channel, we have a, um, we have all of the the, uh, the recordings uploaded there, tinyurl.com slash watch dash WIOT 2020. And if there are any questions at any time through the um, session over the next hour, feel free to send me an email at tjneal at usf.edu. I will try my best to respond through the session as quickly as I can. And other than that, we will see all of you in the poster session. Thank you. So we are going to leave this uh, Zoom and we're not going to come back to this room. We will break out to all the Zoom. Right. So we will break out from here, go to the poster Zoom sessions, and following that, I believe that concludes the workshop. Thank you, everybody, again. Thank you. Meet us in the, the poster session. Mm -hmm. Ready.